We welcome a Mike McGlone, Senior Commodities and Crypto Strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence. Welcome to the Bloomberg Crypto Summit. Very excited today about our lineup, and like, but I need to start by acknowledging our sponsors, BitGo and Grayscale Investments. Before we get started, we need to go over a few housekeeping items. If you experience any issues with audio or video during their, our broadcast, try to refresh your browser. If that's, that doesn't work, you can go to the support tab in the event chat box where one of our engineers will be able to help you out. Also, we wanna hear from you today. We can, you can send your questions via the Q&A box just to the right of your video player. We'll do our best to get to as many of your questions as we can, so please bear with us if you don't see your question approved right away. And please engage us on social media using the hashtag Bloomberg Crypto and at Bloomberg Live and at Crypto. With that, I can dig into my outlook and I wanna start with being selfish and one of those things I can't, I think we all can't wait to do once we're kind of past this, this COVID period and this, um, this uh, pandemic period. And that is one thing I love doing is when I get invited to uh, go to London to do commodity panels and stuff is I love going to the British Museum. And one of the key things, first places I go is to hoards. And it's always really struck me is the story of the Hoxnia whore, that big box of gold that someone had to hide. It was probably a Roman, one of the Roman uh, leaders had to hide during the fall of the Roman Empire, never came back to claim it. And that to me is where I like to lead off to what we see and what I see happening with Bitcoin. It really struck me last summer when Michael Slayer came out and gave the example of a bridge that was built during Roman times. And the architect put his name on it. It was built for to last thousands of years. So I think to me, this is a question I was asked, asked live on TV once that really struck me was, um, Guy Johnson asked me, so what problem does it solve? And to me, that's the problem that Bitcoin solves. It is a digital reserve asset in a world that's going digital. It's something the world has never really had, where we can transact, transmort, port, transmit, and on a 24-7 basis on our cell phones. I, I just, you know, to me, that's what's happening. And one thing I love what I do in Bloomberg Intelligence is I'm completely neutral. My job is to get it right, number one, for terminal users, and it trickles down to events like this, which to me are great. Um, so 2018, I didn't make a lot, of, a lot of friends. I was very bearish Bitcoin. Um, but since April of 2019, I've been bullish. And that's when, what recently was just reviewed, when the New York Attorney General came down in Tether and the market said, guess what? We don't care. Volume has been increasing. Market, um, market cap has been increasing. And at this juncture, I look at it as a strategist, what's gonna make it stop? So two key words we need to think about, I think for the future and to think about in cryptos is prudent accumulation. I think that's what's really happening. Diversification, and I see risks tilted against the naysayers in this space. It's just prudent now to put some of your assets in Bitcoin. Now, so we're seeing happen that with a bit, a bit of a flood. So let's put some numbers on this. We're at the 50,000 threshold. I want to thank the sponsors and the event planners who set this up months ago. They just knew we'd be at my initial 50,000 uh, threshold uh, by the time we did the event at 51,000 at the moment in Bitcoin. To me, the next key threshold, the next key level is 100,000 on the year from a normal Bitcoin standpoint. That doesn't really mean a lot. Supply is declining. As you can see in the chart, it's just not a big move. And Demand's picking up, and then we have this macroeconomic environment that's complete, increasingly favorable. So I don't see what's going to make it stop. A key point I like to point out is volatility. If we look back, yeah, volatility's been high. But if you look forward, by the time we get to 2024, the next halving, Bitcoin volatility will probably be the same as gold. Um, and you have to remember what stage of life cycle we're in. We're in the price discovery stage. Let's look at it as a two-factor model. Bitcoin supply, like any other commodity ever, is fixed and known. Everything else is uncertain. So in a stage of the life cycle, I look at it, something's got to trip that up, which I can't predict. Otherwise, we should just keep doing what Bitcoin's been doing for its history, appreciating. And then, of course, we have the rest of the space. Well, what I want to point out about the rest of the space, which are, a lot of our guests and we'll be digging into, is digital dollar dominance. And that's what I want to leave you with before I go to our first panel, and that is the advent, the use of digital currencies is accelerating in digital assets, but the dollar is dominant. By trading volume, it's dollar trading of digital stable to coins, most notably Tyler, is more than double that of Bitcoin. So if our government's worried about 
uh, crypto assets, I think the best thing we can do is embrace it with regulation, just like we did the internet. So with that, I want to move on to our first panel with Glenn Hutchins. As Eric explained to me, Eric Schaxer explained to me as we were, I was getting my dome covered in the makeup room, Glenn was one of the first, I would he, he described as more traditional investors who latched on the cryptos in Bitcoin and understood it, but more from a techno standpoint. I'm more macro in markets. So with that, Eric, I want to pass it over to you. Take it away. Hi, everybody. I'm Eric Schatzker, and I am delighted to welcome Glenn Hutchins. Glenn is a pioneer in private equity. He co-founded Silver Lake. He's now chairman of North Island and North Island Ventures. And Glenn, anybody who's been following the crypto sphere for any length of time knows that you were early, certainly one of the earliest people on Wall Street to see its promise. Um, but it's important to point out that you come to crypto as a technology investor. And I think of that as a very different place than the people who are, say, punting on Bitcoin today, or even the macro types who think of Bitcoin and talk about Bitcoin as digital gold. Let's begin there. What makes the way you think about crypto and look at crypto different from some of the other notable voices out there I would mention, say, Elon Musk, perhaps, or Mike Novogratz, or maybe Chamath Palahapitya. People are listening to them. I want them to listen to you. Thank you, Eric, and nice to see you. Nice to be with you. Um, so one of the ways I put it is if in the first part of the conversation about this new space, uh, people don't use the word protocol, they have an incomplete understanding of the technology. Um, and so the way to think about this is the, um, there are three, in, three inseparable technologies that work together to create the cryptocurrency solution. Uh, and they are the token. Most people know about the Bitcoin token, but there are many others. Uh, the uh, blockchain, which is essentially an accounting ledger, uh, and the protocol, in, in either the Bitcoin protocol or the Ethereum protocol or other protocols. Uh, in my view, the protocol, and most people who are thinking about building companies around products in this area think the protocol is the vastly most important piece of the technology. One analogy I would use to let people understand this is, in the payments world, we oftentimes use the term the rails, a ra railroad metaphor. And if you were to analogize this to the railroad, the uh, boxcar would be the token uh, into which you embed something of value and move it from one place to another. The blockchain would be the cargo invoice, uh, and the protocol would be the rails. And remember, the part that transformed the world was the building of the rails. So that is a very good analogy. In fact, it's the analogy, you've been very consistent with the analogy, Glenn. It's the same analogy I heard you use to describe, it was Bitcoin back then, in 2016, the first time I ever heard you talk about crypto. Uh, it right. makes as much sense now uh, as it did then. But the reality, as you're well aware, is that people are fixated on tokens, right? Tokens is where right. the speculative fever is. Tell me a little bit about how you would try to change people's approach and attitude toward crypto as a thing, as something of use, perhaps even something of value beyond thinking about it as a you know, a, a, a punter's vehicle, right? That, that, that today, if Bitcoin, for example, today trading at $51,000, but a month ago at a very different level. So the, the way, what I'm interested in is building companies that uh, use this as an application. Uh, as Steve Jobs once said, when we were referring to market research, I don't do any research, he said, because they don't know they want it until I show it to them. Uh, and so I think what we have to do is show consumers use cases for this technology, and then they'll understand what it is. A very good one that's out there right now is a product called NBA Top Shot, uh, which is produced it, This by, is actually, uh, a, I mean, people may not be familiar with it, but it's a craze, right? It's, it's, it's sweeping yes. through the collectibles community. 
and, and through the sports world, right? Uh, so it's uh, digital trading cards. You buy a trading card. It's issued by a company called Dapper Labs. Uh, the first application is with the NBA, uh, and they issue cards that are unique digital, unique video images of individual players doing individual kind of moves in a game. A famous one right now is Zion Williamson swatting a block shot up into the stands. Uh, and you uniquely own that image uh, and uh, can buy, you buy it at an auction from Dapper when they um, auction it off to begin with. And then it trades on their flow network or protocol. I use the words network and protocol reasonably interchangeably. Uh, and then it settles on their blockchain. Uh, and uh, the Zion Williamson, last I looked, it's been a few days, so it moves around, but the Zion Williamson trading card, which was issued, I think, in the teens in terms of dollars, is now trading at $200,000. Uh, the NBA is generating about a million dollars a day in revenue from both primary and secondary market sales of these products. And the Flow token, which is the token that, that is the means of exchange on the Flow network, uh, which you see some price charts out there was issued in the uh, uh, below a dollar is now trading at over um, twenty dollars. Uh, so uh, and so the whole this is the first application of a product that is that the public sees, where there's a digital good that people are buying, there's a marketplace in which they can trade on the secondary market, there's a um, a uh, blockchain that settles it where you can see who had the two who what the new transaction is, and there's a token that makes it operate that has a secondary value. You, you, you also raises this issue of digital gold. Uh, and the analogy I've tried to use for people is that it's more like digital copper than gold. Uh, you know, and the copper has a use case. People buy copper uh, and store value in it, um, the way you do silver, platinum, or gold, or whatnot, as a, as a, a commodity. But copper is or historically grows or, or declines in value based upon its use case. Uh, you know, if people are building more houses and doing more wiring in their houses, the value of copper goes up and, 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 and the, uh, it's the same in reverse. So it is both a store of value, but it also is an industrial metal that's used with a particular purpose. That's the better way to think about tokens than it is just a gold equivalent unit. Well, let's talk about tokens and Bitcoin specifically, because you do hear about Bitcoin being the digital equivalent of gold all the time. Um, it's popular in the macro investing community. Bitcoin is digital gold. Bitcoin's a commodity. Bitcoin is a store of value. Bitcoin is a hedge against inflation. Is any of that true in your mind? Just the way you buy metals and they can be stores of value, hedges against inflation, et cetera, yes. But the primary purpose of them of, the, of Bitcoin is not to just do this, is not to store the value. It's to um, uh, have a use case that makes it valuable. And so the other way to think about this is, uh, if you if a song or a movie is more valuable the extent to, to the owner of the, of the of the copyright to the extent to which it's played more. So mm -hmm. if you have, a to you have a token on the, like the, to the flow token on the flow network that's operating uh, NBA Top Shot has grown in value because of the use of the token to transact on the network. Ah, okay, Th that, but that's different from what we see happening. Again, I'll use Bitcoin as an example today, right? Bitcoin goes that's from 40 to 50,000, been... not because the use cases for Bitcoin are getting any better, in fact, one could make the argument, and it's been made by many, that the use cases for Bitcoin are actually quite minimal. They're exciting for other tokens, but Bitcoin doesn't have many. Would you agree? Okay, well, so there, there are two elements to this. One is there, I don't have the numbers at my, my fingertips, and what I have in my head is a little bit old, but there was, I think, a trillion dollars in transactions settled on with Bitcoin last year. I mean, it's, it's a very significant um, uh, commodity that's being that's being uh, transacted as, as a means of exchange. Right. Yeah, right. Um, so, and but also for all sorts of financial transactions um, uh, around the world, and it's growing substantially in use. But I would say the, there's a one of the issues that one needs to get one next level down to think about this is that bit, if there is a problem with Bitcoin, it's that it is, and there are a couple of problems. Take a step back. Um, academics and regulators see problems as obstacles 
entrepreneurs see problems as opportunities. Uh, and so, um, yes, it is true there are some significant problems with Bitcoin. Yes, it is true there were significant problems 25 years ago with email. That didn't stop us from perfecting that technology uh, and making it now ubiquitous. So one of the problems with Bitcoin is that it is expensive to do the, the what's called the mining or the transaction. What I think of as the better analogy than mining is transaction processing. Because Energy intensive. It's a, yeah, very and, and capital intensive because you have to buy all this um, uh, what they call mining equipment, which is really high end servers. Uh, and so um, that's because the solution that's at the heart of the Bitcoin uh, technology is called proof of work, uh, which means in order to crypt to, to use the cryptography necessary to make a transaction secure and also put it on the blockchain in a way that's authentic, unalterable, and accepted by the community requires a the solution to a very complicated math problem, problem cryptographic problem that the person running the data center who solves that problem puts the block on the blockchain and then is paid in a fraction of a Bitcoin to do that. Um, so that turns out to be a pretty expensive uh, solution to the cryptography um, part of this puzzle. The, the creation of Ethereum and then other tokens like that um, had, had put us in a direction called proof of stake, which is a much cheaper way to uh, validate a transaction where you just use the tokens you own on the network to stake the network, to guarantee the transaction as it were. And they get paid a minor fee to do that. That's more uh, valuable for, um, that's more useful for larger numbers of smaller transactions that don't, that don't require the huge amount of, um, of a security that the Bitcoin solution offers. Uh, and it's also what's behind most of what they call NFTs, non-fungible tokens like Flow and others. Uh, and so um, what people can do, and I think what you're seeing happening, is people are taking their the, the, trend, the value from the transaction out, out of the non-fungible token networks where they can be done rapidly and cheaply, and then bringing them back into Bitcoin at the end of the day in larger amounts of transactions. So in that sense, ironically, even though I say that in the freshman year class that Bitcoin is not a store of value in the graduate level class, you say, well, it actually might be uh, because it's the um, it could be the you could it could be the use case for transactions, small numbers of very large transactions where you want to pay for the cost associated with securing the network. Okay, you're almost where I want you to be here, which is how should we think well, then I gotta about find it, a perhaps even on a philosophical era. level. But and, 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 and I say this, Glenn, because you know the contours of this debate very well, right? The Bitcoin faithful say any amount of energy, right, that unshackles the denizens of the world from fiat currency and unelected central bankers justifies the cost, right, any amount. And then there's the other more environmental side of the argument, which says that's libertarian nonsense, right? And that burning as much power as Switzerland to mine Bitcoin is self is a self-indulgent disgrace, not to mention the next step toward, I don't know, climate change Armageddon. So those are two very, very different poles in the debate. And, you know, who should we side with? You might not be surprised to learn that I side with neither of those poles. Uh, let me give you a couple of... <laughs> Let me give you a couple of thoughts about this. First of all, um, as I say, um, uh, regulators and pundits see, uh, see um, problems as obstacles and I see them as opportunities. So one of the things we have to do is get at the uh, capital and energy intensivity of the Bitcoin solution in order to kind of to make this technology more um, uh, useful. And also there's a, the second problem is it can be very slow. Uh, and so you, there's some ideas about scaling networks off the chain and bringing fewer transactions on the chain, which uh, will reduce the amount of, um, of uh, uh, energy intensity. But the, the thing, that, so, but let me make a bigger point here. To take a step back, um, the, one of the three, there are three key elements to the Bitcoin solution to the problem of trust-free exchange, which is where this all comes from, the, the famous Byzantine generals problem. Uh, and they are distributed systems, uh, in set game theory incentives, and um, cryptography. Uh, and you have to understand that those three elements come together to create this solution. So let's go back to the first, which we haven't talked about, which is distributed systems, also known as networks. 
One of the things at, in the end state of this being successful, and there's a good, uh, the, this goes under the heading of something called decentralized finance or DeFi, which you've probably heard of. DeFi. Right. What you're doing is breaking, taking hierarchical institutions like JP Morgan and taking out the hierarchy, the costs associated with their hierarchical control of the financial system and turning that control over to a broadly distributed community that validates transactions and takes out a huge amount of the cost associated with running a financial system that today is based upon hierarchical nodes that have a lot of power and have a lot of pricing power as transactions occur. So my point is that if you get to that world, you're taking out and replacing a lot of the processing power that's already being used in the financial services industry. It's not a net addition. There's subtraction plus addition. You have to think about that. Um, so if you probably look at kind of what the financial services institutions around the world use in terms of processing power, it's a very large amount of processing power as well. So I just think about that first thing. Uh -huh. uh, and the, sec the second thing I would say is my personal view, a lot of this stuff about uh, liber liberating finance from regulation and central banks and all sorts of stuff is nonsense. Um, we, uh, the, this industry needs to work, must work, has to work inside the regulatory framework. Uh, a few years ago, there was this thing called ICOs that were very popular. I wouldn't touch them with a 10-foot pole. Uh, they largely were very clearly to me, um, you know, um, unregi uh, unregistered securities offerings. And I think the SEC pretty quickly took the same point of view. Uh, in a very similar way, um, this industry needs to work within the constraints of the uh, regulatory systems of the countries that they operate in, as well as the international uh, system. Uh, that's the way it's going to thrive. Uh, and what that means is um, that um, the regulatory industry, the regulatory community needs to create smart regulation, you know, rather than have, um, you know, uh, either try to fit this industry into kind of old forms of regulation or have uninformed points of view. So, for instance, we've so, seen a couple of senior officials recently say that Bitcoin is all used for uh, illicit transactions. And it turns out that less than 2% in many years, less than 1% of Bitcoin transactions are illicit. While U.S. cash, $100 bills, um, um, are 80 to 90% of them used in organized crime and uh, tax evasion. So we need let, to get let me beyond jump in for a those moment, simplistic because... understanding. Go ahead, I'm done. No, if, if you're if 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 what you say is true and and at some point it probably will be that we'll get smart regulation and that crypto will become part of the established financial system as opposed to something on the fringe. The real promise of these technologies, the reason that I understand you got into it from the first place is because what it could do for the friction, right, the cost in functions like payments, right, or clearing. Correct or custody, these are essential components of the financial system that help to make banks like JP Morgan as profitable as they are and to generate the return on assets that they currently do. What happens if crypto takes those profits away from the financial system, eliminates the friction there, or in something like real estate, right, where you have to deal with a lawyer, you have to deal with title insurance, you have to deal with registration, you have to deal with all that nonsense? Well, that, that's part of the vision of this, right? Which is that, um, so I'll give you, I'll make an analogy. We, in the last 20 years of trading on Wall Street, there's been a lot of news recently, you might have noticed, about GameStop and other things. Uh, uh, a lot of that is, is the end result of, not this GameStop stuff, but just kind of what's going on now. It's the end result of adding, putting technology into, into equity markets and taking over 99% of the cost out of trading in equities. Mm -hmm. Today, the cost is less than 1% of what it was 20 years ago to trade in equities. Uh, we've gone from eight through quarter spreads to sub penny spreads and from huge commissions to zero commissions. During that same time period, uh, uh, the, the credit card companies think they've had a birthright to 2 to 3% of every dollar that moves around the world. FX costs 5 to 7%. Um, remittances cost close to 10%. Payday loans can cost up to 20%. Uh, and to be able to reduce those prices to consumers uh, by 50, then 75, then 90 percent uh, will be a massive consumer welfare benefit. It's one of the reasons why. So, so ballpark it, ballpark it for this. me. What percentage of the profits in a financial system do you think today are at risk because of the promise of 
effectively the protocol, as you said, right, these various protocols that enable transformation uh, on a technological level? So I haven't quantified that, Eric, so I really don't know. I can't give you a good answer. I would say that the way I think about it is that uh, I think that the, the deposit taking and lending will continue to be core, highly regulated elements of the money center banks. All the services, and you alluded to some of them around that, that, that payments, custody, settlement, clearing, all those sorts of things that are their services, businesses that they charge very high fees for um, and they have, they have very high returns on capital on, uh, will be ones that this uh, technology can go after uh, and can take massive amounts of cost out. That's the way to think about it. Glenn, I want to conclude. The number. <laughs> well, I, I would like you to, because I know you've put a tremendous amount of thought and study into these kinds of things. And in our next conversation, we can talk about that. But I wanted to conclude this conversation that we're having, which I think has been incredibly informative, Glenn, by asking you a crass question. You've been sure. a crypto investor for a long time. If you were to evaluate the crypto, and I'm using that in broad terms, the crypto portfolio that you and your son James have built at North Island in X terms, which is to say multiple terms, what kind of return have you generated? You have to be an investor to get that number, Eric. <laughs> Glenn, it's always a pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us here at our Crypto Summit. Glenn Hutchins is the co-founder of Silver Lake and the chairman of North Island and North Island Ventures. Thank you. Why did you invest in gold? Are you living in the past? In a digital world, gold shouldn't weigh down your portfolio. You see where things are going. Digital currencies like Bitcoin are the future. They're secure, borderless, and unlike gold, they actually have utility. Leave the pack behind. It's time to drop gold. Go digital. Go grayscale. Hello, and we're back. And thank you, Eric and Glenn, for that. I was impressed with your matching glasses. I don't have mine on right now, but maybe I should put them back on so I can see and hear better. But I'm excited about our panel with Kathy Wood of ARC Investment Management and Michael Schoenstein of Grayscale Investments. Um, I want to start off right away by cutting to the chase with having two great panelists like you. I want to get right to what you think, where we're going in the future. And Kathy, I'm going to start with you with a tough question. Um, as a strategist, I always look forward, okay, where are markets going and why? And the key things, the key inflection points that really kicked in for me this year was when the world's largest automaker by market cap, as we know who that is, Tesla, allocated, started allocating some of its wealth to Bitcoin. And since that's happened, uh, let's see, Tesla's up about 35 percent, Bitcoin's down about 15 percent. Now, I'm a strategist. I'm always looking for things to kick in and make the market look different. But one thing that's really I look at is, is volatility on Bitcoin has dropped to the lowest ever versus Tesla, depending on your measurement, looking 260 days or so. But you're an investor in both of those spaces. Um, and that's why I want to start out is what's your thoughts about what I just said? And if I'm an, you think I'm an idiot, please say that. And looking forward, what's your thoughts most notably for Bitcoin and potential that relationship with the world's largest, largest automaker? Uh, sure. Well, um, we're, as you know, very optimistic on both. I think the biggest surprise to us in the last year, we expected institutional investors to start moving into uh, Bitcoin. Uh, on that score, Mass Mutual was a surprise, a positive surprise to think about all the hoops that Mass Mutual had to go through to put $100 million on its general account, even though it's 0.001%. They had to go through a lot of regulatory hoops. So that was a big surprise or a positive surprise, though we expected institutional investors to start moving in. What we did not expect from institutions was, you know, the diversification uh, on their balance sheet, you know, diversification of their cash assets into Bitcoin. That has been a, a positive surprise that uh, we think is going to continue. We think that... Uh, uh, and there's another thing that uh, we think could come out of this related to it. You think about 60-40 when you talk about balanced accounts, 60% equity, 40% bonds. Well, look what's happening to bonds right now. 
uh, talk about the need for diversification here. If we are ending a 40-year secular decline in interest rates and are even just flattening out or moving up slightly, that asset class has done its thing. What's next? And we think crypto could be uh, the solution there. Well, I want to transition to Michael. Now, my key thing you said was if. Why should we be ending a 40-year 40 40 year trend in lower rates when I look at it, this is one of the most significant deflationary periods I've ever seen. Like you pointed out in your radio interview the other day about uh, you know the average cost of an EV is going to drop to $18,000 a gallon, in, or I mean, a, a per unit. And I look at things like natural gas, the best indicator of deflation I've ever seen is down 80% from its highs and just can't go up. Um, I'll transition to Michael with that in a second, but why Why would we, what I look at is trends your friend, why should we end now, end that trend of lower rates? Right, well, I think, unless we're going to negative rates or, very, very, you know, the spreads have come down so low, treasury yields are so low because of quantitative easing. I don't think rates are going up a lot. I agree with you. We are in a deflationary environment for two reasons. One is massive innovation, which is technologically enabled and deflationary in nature. And then the second is creative destruction, uh, which is caused by disruptive innovation, forcing highly leveraged companies to cut prices to support their debt service. So we see those two coming at us, yes. Uh, uh, but we do know there's a concern given all of the quantitative easing and the unhinged monetary volume. Policy. There's no rules-based monetary policy out there uh, except for Bitcoin and crypto. Uh, so we think this diversification makes sense in terms of cash, but fixed income has really done 40 years of very hard work and sure, we'll be in a deflationary environment, but uh, if Bitcoin is uh, represents a new asset class, why not uh, move into it? So thus, in part of your... I well, that's Kathy part of your investment in grayscale funds, which is where Michael kicks in. Yeah, I mean, Kathy hit the nail right on the head. If you boil down her commentary, which is spot on, if you're an investor in today's environment, you are having to navigate an environment unlike we've ever seen before, not to mention there are investment opportunities that are now available that have been related to the birth of entirely new asset classes uh, like cryptocurrency. And it's great to see forward-thinking investors like Kathy and her team embracing that. I think certainly thinking through the macroeconomic policy that we've seen in the wake of COVID, that has been something that has resonated very meaningfully with our institutional investor audience. The fact that assets like Bitcoin are verifiably scarce and thinking about that quality as compared to perpetual money printing is a very large juxtaposition. And when you have people like Mass Mutual and you have corporates like Square and MicroStrategy and now Tesla, you know, these are companies that are being led by, you know, forward thinking entrepreneurs. The companies themselves are innovators and disruptors in their respective fields. We're not surprised to see companies allocating to this asset class on their balance sheet and the snowball effect that it has had of providing additional air cover for additional investor participation is not to be understated in the least. And I think over the course of 2021, we're gonna see even more corporate participation in this asset class because really the career risk has gone from why to why not. And, and these are long-term strategic allocations for a lot of these types of investors. Well, Michael, my, my uh, colleague, Eric Belchinas and James Safer pointed out that the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust if it was an ETF, would be the top 2% of volume and asset flows on the planet. I think that's part of the innovation, including from the ARK investments. Um, but the key thing I also see is a major shift. I like to compare fund flows in that GBTC versus outflows lately and the total um, total holdings of, of gold. And I see that trend mm -hmm. kicking in, like today. You see gold down almost 2% and Grayscale Trust up, up almost 2%. To me, this is a trend that I'm worried about accelerating. Are you sensing that and seeing that? But funds, funds are certainly going that way. There is little doubt in our mind um, that it is of not you know, any kind of coincidence that Q4 of 2020 saw some of the largest outflows on record uh, from gold investment products. 
um, at a time when Bitcoin, you know, really broke out and hit some of its new all-time high prices. And certainly this narrative around Bitcoin being a digital gold or a digital store of value is a pretty widely held narrative now ar around the investment community. And so thinking about the popularity of Grayscale products or really just the ability to gain exposure to digital assets in the form of a security, I think really represents just how much market demand there is. Because as we look at the pipes and the maturity um, of the digital asset ecosystem, you know, I'm sure you and Kathy will agree that this rally feels very different than the one we experienced in 2017. But despite its price run, is still ripe for opportunity because crypto still largely exists outside of their traditional channels where investors are making, you know, investment allocations. So yep. a, a question for both of you, and that I've heard a lot in the chat, unless Kathy, unless you want to comment on that. No, I was just going to say what's striking is the dollar is down. Just take today's action. The dollar is down, which is normally a positive cue for gold. Gold is down at the same time. Bitcoin is up. Uh, that's very interesting. And I also think that uh, the dollar having dropped on a trade weighted basis by 7% last year and now resuming that downtrend is another stimulus. It should be a stimulus for gold too, uh, but it is clear at the margin that Bitcoin is getting the flow that, uh, the, the incremental flow that normally might be going to gold. Well, to me, that's a key point that's happening lately. I, I mentioned this on live TV, and sometimes you get the pushback. It's like, oh, that's the trigger I wanted. I see Bitcoin, certainly today, potentially transitioning to the risk off asset. I mean, funds are flowing from equities, i.e. Tesla, uh, from bonds, from gold. And you look at days like today, bonds are down, stocks are down, Bitcoin's up. Is that a potential here? Is, are we kicking into inflection where Bitcoin maybe is a risk off asset? It's I, Tina, there's no other alternative. I think we are in such early days here. When you think that the market cap or network value of Bitcoin is roughly 900, 950 billion dollars, think about that in the in the context of an Apple. It's less than half of Apple's valuation, and here we're talking about the reserve currency of the crypto asset world, the first global digital monetary system. Uh, it's a very big idea, and now we have institutions moving, uh, embracing this idea, or at least uh, using Bitcoin as a hedge uh, against what could go wrong. And so, uh, as you say, Mike, there is a, a, a risk off. I mean, when you think about it, cash is supposed to be uh, the ultimate risk off uh, uh, asset of choice. And, and here we have uh, Bitcoin serving that role. It's very interesting. I don't. I think it Michael? may be early to say it's risk off, though, Mike. Um, what What I would say, though, what we're seeing and experiencing from investors is that it's not necessarily only going to be those momentum traders or folks that generally only invest in technology or technology related investments that have become excited about allocating to crypto. Um, thinking about our investor base, we're really starting to see allocations across investor mandates. Um, and it's not just global macro folks for whom crypto now could certainly be considered to be part of um, the ways in which they invest in their investment mandates, but it's really moving towards even value investors, risk arb investors. It really runs the entire gambit. And I think, you know, the reason why I say it may be early to call it risk off is because it's now generally going to be accepted as something that everyone can evaluate as an investment option, but I still would say it's not necessarily something that's going to be appropriate for every investor out there. Well, that's and a I, good point. And I clearly, pre go ahead, go ahead, Kathy. Sorry. No, no, I, I agree with uh, Michael on this. It is we are so early that that 900, 950 billion dollar market cap gives you a sense, or network value gives you a sense of how early we are and the and the various use cases that we have uh, 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 written about. Uh, Yasin Almandra, our uh, crypto analyst, we've got the white papers on our site, arcinvest.com, uh, has delineated as institutions move in, um, you know, where an appropriate uh, asset allocation will be, uh, 
uh, given risk uh, and return uh, parameters, various ones. Uh, and we also have dimensioned the use cases, the insurance policy that this represents against not only unhinged monetary policy, but outright confiscation of wealth in other countries, demonetization, uh, trade settlement. When you aggregate all of these use cases uh, for Bitcoin and assume a, a conservative allocation, let's say in the, in, in the terms of cash uh, or insurance policies, you do get into the trillions of dollars of market cap potential out there. So very early days. I think that's a key word I want to expand on is early. And I really appreciate you saying, Mike, it's early to say it's going risk off. That's my job is try to figure those things out ahead of time and watch the little fun flows and everything. And, and I need pushback because when everybody agrees with you, it's a lesson you learn as an ex-trader, then you're usually wrong. But I want to bring in a key point about early days. And it's these dangling carrots of that keep me very bullish. And that is ETFs in the U.S. And I didn't say singular, it's plural. Obviously, we, obviously we have in Canada now. This is a question for both of you, and it's something that comes up in the in the IB Bloomberg chat all the time about this grayscale premium. And I've been pointing out forever. Here's the 200-day moving average of the premium. It's going down with with maturity and everything. Um, but what's happened in Canada with the advent of the ETFs is some of the other trusts have gone to a, a discount. So both of you, certainly you, Michael, and you, Kathy, as an investor, is that a potential risk with GBTC, which is now one of the most widely traded ET, I would say, exchange traded products in, compared to an ETF in the space? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a risk, um, no question about it. But ultimately, price discovery in GBTC every day is driven entirely by market forces. Um, you know, Mike, to directly answer your question, an ETF here in the U.S. is something that we've long believed is a matter of when, um, you know, not a matter of if. Um, as you know, we, we spent the better part of 2017 looking to register GBTC on the NYSC as an ETF, made tremendous progress with the commission. And, and I'd say, actually, the commission has done a fantastic job um, engaging with us and other folks within the community. But they have still cited um, some different dynamics within the digital asset market and Bitcoin specifically that have not yet matured um, that they would want to see in place before they could get comfortable with an ETF. And so while we're definitely encouraged by the growth and the adoption, the development of derivatives, a much you know, healthier two-sided market um, and a lot more participation, um, you know, those, those aspects still remain you know, largely unfulfilled. Um, and, you know, over time, you know, we have to remind ourselves that this asset only came about, you know, 12 or so years ago. And so we're still, again, back to our last comment in very, very early days for it. Yeah, yeah I think I think uh, it'll be very interesting when uh, uh, Gary Gensler comes in as chair of the SEC. He spent the last few years at MIT. He's a student and uh, and a teacher uh, around Bitcoin and blockchain technology. And um, the director of research for crypto at SEC has been um, has been promoted to report directly to the chairman. So uh, I think we're going to see a lot of attention on it, uh, and, and we're and the people who are focused on it really know what they're talking about. I think uh, the early days of the SEC, there was like uh, you know. Uh, we're not quite sure what animal this is. Okay, now they are sure, and that's very healthy. I think it's positive for uh, uh, ultimately for approval of a an exchange traded product. And I think the most important thing, just think about what we're saying here. Um, the risk everyone used to bring up to us when we first started getting, when we were first involved uh, very early on with Grayscale. Um, uh, and, and still very much uh, involved with Grayscale's GPTC. Uh, the risk we always heard, the pushback was, the government's going to shut this down. Uh, I think we've moved far away from that. And here we're putting into place uh, a, a chairman of the SEC who's very familiar with Bitcoin, understands its value, and a research director on crypto whose, back, whose background is more technology than finance. That's a terrific combination. Michael, thoughts on that one? I'm sorry? Any thoughts on that? My, my, my sense is um, 
I'm too much of an optimist, but I really hope and I think the U.S. is going to embrace this like we did the Internet and regulate it. Um, like Kathy just said, the potential risks of, to me, it's completely tilted the other way. If the U.S. is smart, they'll do the opposite of what China's doing, our, our rival now. Any thoughts on that with this embracing this space? Most notably, this is a decentralized, organically developed um, global reserve assets, not like all the other cryptos that are, you know, someone else's project or someone else's liability. Sure. Like even Ethereum, product on Ethereum you know, again, I think given where we are in the life cycle of this, the fact that we now have tangible commentary and or policy um, related to this asset class from the SEC, CFTC, IRS, FinCEN, um, Treasury, it, it does definitely add some validation to the asset class sustaining power. And I do think that all of the folks in each of the seats at those respective organizations certainly recognize the role that the regulatory regimes here in the U.S. play on a global level. So to your point, Mike, about this being global in nature, decentralized protocols that are gaining adoption on a global level, certainly the U.S.'s stance and posture towards this is certainly going to be paramount. And, and I certainly know that they appreciate that the world is watching. And so to Kathy's point, having regulators um, you know, taking on new seats who are familiar with this technology, um, you know, we're, we're totally hopeful that they will continue to, um, if not broaden uh, their engagement with the industry. I just so want to make, think of, go ahead. Oh, sorry, make one comment on, on your, your focus on China, which I believe is apt. Uh, so Bitcoin, the, the Bitcoin blockchain is an open source technology and uh, China, mostly for capital control reasons, really wants to limit its exposure. It wants its own currency. I think this is a really important point because open source technologies, if you're going to isolate your country from all of this innovation, uh, it, you know, that's a problem competitively. And I've, I've been thinking about that uh, quite a bit, our, our competitive uh, dynamic relative to China. Uh, and I, I also agree the regulators uh, at, in the U.S., while they, they have been really uh, not forceful in any way, they, uh, they have basically stood back and they do not want to be blamed for, for preventing the next big thing, the next big thing in the Internet, as you say. And I see there's a question here about the technology. Is this old? Is this going to be old tech? I think that the beauty of the, the Bitcoin blockchain is that its uh, speed and cost are not, you've heard this before in the community, are not bugs. Not, uh, they are features. This is the most secure uh, blockchain out there. And so the idea of digital gold uh, 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 on, in the, the most secure network in the world is really an important concept here. So no, it's not old technology. There are going to be other other technologies, other blockchains for other use cases uh, that will not serve the same purpose as Bitcoin, but I don't think that they will obviate uh, Bitcoin's role. I, I Mike, think that's any right. Mike, any thoughts on that question? Good. Yeah, I mean, as we think about um, the role that Bitcoin plays, um, as well as the adoption and the development of other technologies and, and digital asset protocols, I think for us it's become quite clear that there is going to be differentiation amongst these protocols. And I often try and analogize it for a lot of investors to actually the precious metals family. Um, you know, gold, silver, platinum each uh, exists side by side um, with different prices, different use cases, different addressable markets. And so if you think about that in, in the context of digital assets, there is a future state um, where quite possibly Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, all the various protocols that are continuing to gain adoption, the development of DeFi now, these are all different areas that are unlocking either value, creating savings, um, disintermediating, um, you know, the the trusted system that we are now very, very much accustomed to being a participant in. And so it not necessarily is, in a lot of investors' eyes, going to be a winner-take-all scenario with Bitcoin. But also, to Kathy's point, 
the open source nature of many of these protocols like Bitcoin are really, really important to remember because over time, as the technology gets challenged, as new features need to be added into the protocol, the open source nature of it allows it to morph and grow and mature and add additional functionality over time. And so again, given that we're in the early days of it and Bitcoin hasn't changed all that much over the last few years, that doesn't mean that the development community has slowed down at all. If anything, it's probably as robust as it's ever been, but there is a shared appreciation that Bitcoin hasn't somehow been broken or, or changed too much um, and is still thriving and growing today. Uh, one thing I'll add to that is we watch uh, the developers, the number of developers associated with each protocol. And uh, with Ethereum, it's exploding. Uh, Bitcoin, the number of Bitcoin developers is still moving up steady apace. Uh, given the difference between the protocols and the networks, uh, that, that makes uh, sense to me. Uh, so one thing that I think we will need to focus on in terms of keeping... Um, or uh, sustaining Bit, uh, uh, Bitcoin's blockchain as the most secure out there is we will need to provide support over time as a, an investment community for the, the, the health and, and sustainability of this network. So I, I'm looking forward to getting involved with the community I already have in, in some ways because this is very important. It's a, it's you know a global monetary system. We've never seen anything like this before, and uh, it's rules based, uh, and it's going to make the world a better place. Well, I think that's well described, and I appreciate you bringing that out. And also, you, Michael, mentioned the precious metals, gold, silver, platinum, palladium. As a strategist, I cannot look at gold anymore without concerning Bitcoin, because I think the planet, everybody who's ever held and used gold in the past, who's going to allocate it, knows that if they don't have some of that in Bitcoin, they're at risk. So I want to bring out that key thing that I think about daily. I want to grab this from you: is what are the key risks we should we you are afraid of, we should be afraid, uh, be uh, aware of in this space. And maybe we should start with you first, Michael, and then go to Kathy. I think every day that Bitcoin doesn't die um, gives all of us greater confidence that Bitcoin is going to continue to fulfill uh, its ultimate potential and promise. Um, I've been involved in this space now for eight years. I can't tell you how many times I've either been told or read that Bitcoin is dead. Um, or somehow something has surfaced to um, become a Bitcoin killer. And so for me, I think one of the biggest threats is probably just education and, and the lack thereof. So when we are able to get in front of audiences like we are today, it's really, really, really important to kind of dispel a lot of these preconceived notions that a lot of folks have not shrugged off. People still say, you know, Bitcoin failed. I can't buy a latte with Bitcoin. You know, that, that's not necessarily going to be the measure of success for Bitcoin in today's world, in the developed world, where the financial services system candidly works pretty well. Is it as cheap or as fast or efficient as it could be? Obviously not. But the real world, the real developed world use case around this is, is really around a digital gold or digital store of value. And so one of the things that I think we're very committed to is, is education and particularly education for policymakers. You know, there's a question here about uh, Janet Yellen's comments on Bitcoin. And so, you know, recently Grayscale um, donated to um, the leading think tank in DC called Coin Center, which is really not only developing, um, you know, some of the best thoughts and practices around how to innovate and ensure that as regulators um, are often furnished now with policies or bills related to digital assets, that they don't dismiss them based on their lack of engagement or understanding of them, but rather can really approach them in a really informed way. And so I think regulatory clarity um, is something that we've achieved and is not stopping investors from participating today. But we actually view this as, as further regulatory clarity actually being an opportunity that can continue to substantiate the asset class and help it actually kind of foster innovation around it. Yeah, and I'll add uh, another element that uh, Janet Yellen brought up, I guess now Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen brought up, uh, was the environmental risk. And that's the pushback we're getting uh, because of the movement, the ESG movement out there, which has 
um, maybe the SEC is questioning it in the U.S., but in Europe, it is um, it is very strong movement. Uh, and again, Yasin El Mandra, our analyst, uh, has dimensioned uh, the kind of energy use uh, in gold mining and the energy use in uh, traditional financial services, including trade and settlement, right? And, and Bitcoin's energy use compared to those is a fraction. And if you look at where uh, the energy use is, a lot of it is around hydropower uh, and other renewables, but particularly hydropower. So again, much cleaner than traditional uh, businesses running on uh, electricity. So uh, it's it's um, it, it's it's been interesting that that has become such a focal point. I think this is part of the whack-a-mole. They they've been uh, losing, <laughs> and so this is the next uh, you know mole. And uh, I think it's easily uh, countered in terms of narrative. Exactly. There, there is, should not be a narrative somehow, Mike or Kathy, to her point, that Bitcoin is somehow heating up the globe. Um, that, that is not the case at all. To Kathy's point, we're seeing mining being concentrated um, around renewables, hydro, and often actually utilizing power um, that would otherwise go wasted on the grid. So, um, you know, not not something that, that people should sink their teeth too far into. I love that narrative of solving the problem of natural gas flaring, which I'm sure people can Google and we can dig into. So we have a few minutes to give us a little extra time. Um, let's do final words. So, Kathy, why don't you, you let you go final? And Michael, how about any final words you want to leave the audience with? We've got just a few minutes. Uh, final words in terms of how we see uh, Bitcoin evolving here. Uh, I'll start by saying, uh, you know, there are, are a lot of people I've paid attention to, uh, to in my uh, career who are, are looking at, this is going to surprise people because we're so fundamentally driven, but uh, who are looking at charts. And I know that the Bitcoin uh, world had, had, well, really got its big start around hedge funds and traders, uh, commodities traders in particular. Uh, I heard uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, someone I trust who's uh, got both a fundamental bias and a technical bias when it comes to charts. He said, I've never seen this before. He said, uh, this, uh, this asset peaked in 2017 and normally, just based on the charting that I do, uh, one would have expected uh, the next peak or, or it to take off in about 10 years. In the meantime, it would just lay fallow. That has not happened. And that is because there are some important use cases uh, around mitigating the risks that we're all facing. Uh, and so again, the big surprise to me was uh, a substitution for cash on balance sheet. So you can say uh, partly risk off, but really insurance policy. And I think that's a lot of what we are seeing right now. Uh, that, as I think Michael said earlier, decision makers have to have a point of view here. They cannot just whack the mole again because they're running out of moles. Michael, you have 30 um, seconds. That's well said. I think, you know, Mike, you know, if, if someone had told anybody to buy Apple or Amazon uh, stock a decade ago, um, back then people would have said, you know, those were very strange business ideas, very strange companies. But today, you know, those types of businesses are, are, are visionary. Um, and so I'm not necessarily talking about Bitcoin or blockchain technology necessarily becoming that with any sense of, of assurance. But what if what if they are? And so to Kathy's point about about being um, something that can be, you know, changing the world or not ignoring it, um, we are kind of tasking with investors of number one, digging in on the space and number two, making sure that they're not ignoring it. So don't let this once in a generation opportunity uh, pass folks by. With that, let's move on to our next panel and what you said, what Kathy said, I, I've never seen this before, it comes up a lot, but we have some more mics. We have Mike Belshi, co-founder and CEO of BitGo and Michael Morrow, CEO of Genesis, moderated by my colleague Olin Karoff of Bloomberg Business News. With that, pass it on to you and thank you very much for your time and for your insights. Thank you. Since 2013, institutions have trusted BitGo for their digital asset needs. 
Backed by Goldman Sachs and other top investors, BitGo brings together the best of Wall Street and Silicon Valley to deliver institutional-grade security, compliance, and services. Today, we support a long list of coins and blockchain protocols and process 20% of all on-chain Bitcoin transaction volume for over 400 of the world's top institutions. When it comes to crypto, institutions trust BitGo. Good morning uh, and welcome to the panel on Prime Brokerage. Uh, my name is Olga Karif and I'm a, a journalist uh, with Bloomberg. Uh, I cover crypto and here with me are uh, Mike Belshi. Uh, he is CEO of BitGo and Michael um, uh, Michael Moro, CEO of uh, Genesis. And um, Mike um, Belshi, uh, he got into providing crypto services in uh, 2013, uh, when he was holding Bitcoin for himself and some friends and needed a secure wallet uh, to hold it all in. And um, he started BitGo and started providing institutional investors with liquidity capacity and security solutions. And uh, currently, uh, BitGo uh, is uh, custodying more than $50 billion in assets. And then Michael Moro of Genesis, um, has been CEO of Genesis since 2016 and has grown the business to more than 45 billion in annual trades, loans, and transactions. And uh, before Genesis, Michael spent uh, six years at, uh, as vice president at Second Market and before then, six years working in investment banking at Citi. And uh, I was thinking that uh, maybe kind of the first topic with tackle is sort of what is the difference between uh, you know traditional uh, prime brokerage and uh, crypto prime brokerage and maybe we could start with Michael. With me, got it. Um, sure, happy to be here. Hi everybody. Um, so I think um, there's lots and lots of differences um, kind of between traditional prime brokers um, sort of in the, the equities world and, and what um, both, both Mike and I are building in the crypto world. And, and I think, you know, largely uh, what you're finding kind of in the equities world is a byproduct um, of kind of decades um, of, of kind of work that's being done to cater primarily to hedge funds within the equities world um, and to create a, a one-stop shop. Um, for uh, for hedge funds to uh, to to utilize the uh, prime brokerage platform for their transactions, um, for their borrowing needs, for their custody, as well as sort of fund admin, some of the back office functions in addition to kind of the cap intro. Um, and where we are, I think, in, in the crypto world um, is we're uh, we're trying to bridge the gap between kind of the traditional Wall Street world and, and, and the crypto world, um, but really sort of make the experience of working in crypto very similar um, to what one might expect in from the uh, the traditional prime brokerage world. And so, um, you know, we're we're heads down, um, kind of building out what that bridge looks like, knowing full well that. Lots of nuances, intricacies, and differences in the crypto world, not just from a product perspective, but from a regulatory perspective to kind of build it the right way. Um, and I think our firms are both still on the, the building phase to try to kind of bridge that, bridge that gap. Um, and, uh, and then, Mike, uh, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think um, we have... The, the, the mission today, which is to make digital assets available to everybody around the globe. So whether you're you know, retail investors you know, that are holding it on your own or whether you're at the institutional space, we want everybody to be able to participate. Because once we have that u u ubiquitous connectivity, you know, we can really start to see the innovation and, and, and change occur. So part of that is meeting the metaphor of what people expect today. And traditional uh, in incumbents in from, from equities world or from you know, uh, CFTC type of world, you know, they have a particular set of expectations as to how prime brokers will work, and we're meeting that metaphor exactly so that they can easily bridge over. And that, and that starts with a heavy-duty, you know, compliance and regulatory, you know, making sure that, that, that our entities are all exactly what they would expect. But this is all getting built from scratch because it is actually quite a bit different from what you've seen in the, uh, the other markets. And that's required a lot of work. It's required a ton of work at the technology layer. And then ultimately, 
what we want to do is take the advantages of digital assets, which is really about transparency and openness, and make sure those get projected into the into the financial system of the future. And um, and sort of what are the advantages for for somebody to um, uh, I guess to to trade uh, through a prime brokerage versus uh, versus directly? Uh, maybe we could start uh, with Michael again. Sure. Um, you know, it's it's the one of the key differences I think um, in uh, in in kind of the crypto world, um, kind of compared to the traditional equities world, is you know when you think about stocks, you know um, you, they trade on New York Stock Exchange or Nasdaq, um, and you know in, in the crypto world you have Bitcoin or Ethereum kind of trading on you know dozens and dozens of exchanges around the world. Um, and so what ends up happening um, is the order books are rather siloed, kind of at the exchange level. Um, and in order to really kind of access liquidity, um, you know, individual investors, whether that's kind of retail or, or, or institutional, oftentimes have to park capital across all of these venues um, to be able to try to know what the best bid or offer might be on exchange at any kind of given time. And part of the infrastructure and certainly part of the challenge of um, the, the kind of the prime broker world is how do we enable um, institutional investors to be able to access all of that liquidity without um, having to park that capital to do it in a really sort of capital efficient way. And what prime brokers in this space are trying to do is, 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 is similar to sort of cross margining that you might see in, in the traditional market and really having a, a one-stop shop, um, an integrated platform for folks for buying and selling, um, for, for getting margin and, and leverage on trades, as well as that kind of the custody piece. A lot of the activities, um, there are specialists that kind of focus on these certain verticals. Um, the prime broker experience is attempting to kind of bundle all of them up to really only work with, you know, maybe one or two prime brokers to basically take care of all of your needs as it relates to the uh, the transactional side. And, and Mike, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, again, like the, the thing we've been building over the last, you know, few years is is market structure for, for crypto. So where, where digital assets and Bitcoin uh, started out with just siloed exchanges, you have to pre-fund the exchanges, as Michael said, um, you know, if you want to be able to work in order in the most optimal way, you want to have access to the uh, the deepest liquidity you can get, and that's across multiple exchanges, multiple market makers, et cetera. So um, we've been building that market structure where you're going to have your digital assets stored within qualified custody in a very you know regulated and safe way, cold storage 100%, and yet have access to all of those venues. So you got the deepest liquidity, but you don't have the disadvantages that, that come with like splintering your own capital across you know, six or seven you know, exchanges that are of kind of unknown repute. So the, the future of prime brokerage is to enable all of, all of that. Now, on top of it, um, there's a lot of education that, that's happening. You know, digital assets just feel strange to people. And, you know, we spend a ton of time, like, just helping them walk through, like, what is this? How does it work? Uh, how is it going to affect their balance sheet? How is it going to be accounted for? What are the tax and reporting structures that are going to be needed on the other side? And then depending on their needs, we can help them work orders either through, you know, white glove and we can do an OTC type of service or we've got a platform. But either way, at the bottom layer, what we've got is connectivity to all the exchanges and market makers so that wherever the best price is, you're going to get it. Um, and, and we take care of the details kind of underneath that. Uh, and Mike, um, it, it's kind of interesting. Last year, a bunch of, uh, you know, prime brokers basically uh, debuted within, you know, literally days of each other, sort of could you maybe talk a little bit about the time? I mean, why is now the right time to for prime brokerages to uh, sort of uh, become available? Well, I think it's been uh, it, it's been a destination for many many companies. Obviously, you know, Genesis has been in this space uh, along with Bitco uh, for for quite some time. Uh, we've both been building in slightly different ways, but we've been approaching some of the same destinations, which is making it so that it's really safe for any type of investor, whether you're running a pension fund or an endowment, or whether you're a retail investor, um, to be able to participate. It's about you know, making this, this asset globally available. So I think it's taken some time to build some of the technology, the security at the lowest layers, starting to see that vision as, you know, as the full uh, spectrum of components build up. 
Um, it started to emerge at the same time. Maybe there's some competitive leaks. I, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. I think uh, you know investors do want to have a, a plethora of good, high quality firms that they can work with on prime brokerage or custody, um, so that they know that they're they're not stuck uh, with kind of a, a single vendor, um, uh, all eggs in one basket, so to speak. And Michael, anything you'd like to add? Sure. Uh, look, I, you know, uh, Genesis, we started in 2013. Um, and, and, and frankly, like, you know, trying to pull off a crypto prime broker in 2013, 2014, that's just way too early in, in terms of kind of not just, uh, you know, a market infrastructure perspective, but also from the level of institutional interest, frankly. Um, and, you know, uh, the 2017 uh, crypto bull market as sort of retail and ICO driven as it really was, um, it certainly kind of put Bitcoin and Ethereum and kind of like crypto on the map, right, for, for certain institutional investors to at least start to pay attention to. Um, and it really kind of opened up the, the world, I think, to the possibility of, 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 of investing certainly into this asset class. And that's not to say that, you know, people weren't doing it in 14 and 15, but certainly I think the, the landscape and narrative changed quite a bit. Um, lending and borrowing didn't exist until 2018. Um, we launched our, our lending business in March, so about three years ago. Um, and, it, you know, you're finally kind of talking about like real leverage in, in the spot market. Um, to, to go levered long or short um, in, in via, and which is something that is such like basic, you know, ordinary course of business in the equities world that didn't exist, right? So, you know, it took time, as Mike said, um, for companies and services and products to, to be rolled out. Um, and, and certainly on the custody side, such advancements have been made um, kind of in technology and processes and things like that to kind of get there. So, yeah, I think a bunch of firms, including us and BitGo, kind of announced within like a week of each other, um, you know, in, in May of last year. But it really is a, a, is, is a result of kind of the, uh, you know, how far we've come in the ecosystem to be able to roll it out. Um, and it's, it's, it's a byproduct of kind of the evolution of the asset class, I think. And I was wondering, how has the customer base changed sort of in the recent months? Um, I mean, how much of your uh, customer base right now is uh, like corporates, uh, corporate treasuries? Uh, you know, how much of that are like pension funds? Um, you know, what kind of changes have you seen, especially in the last year? That's uh, sure, me or Mike? Oh, Mike, go ahead, Mike. <clears throat> uh, you know, all boats have been been going up over the last uh, six months for sure. The the coronavirus backdrop I think has accelerated people's in introspection into where are they going to be be investing. Um, back in 2017 18, when there was a big run up, a number of institutional investors came in and they looked around and they were looking for prime brokers and they saw some elements that are coming, but it wasn't quite there. And then what we're seeing now is all of those same firms are coming back. And now they're saying, yes, we're ready to, 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 to hop in. Um, the, the economic backdrop, you know, globally, of course, is affecting things. Uh, of course, the stock market is doing great. Um, you know, a lot of injection of, of cash into, into, the, into the monetary system. And then you, you see a lot of that landing in the stock market. But bonds and, you know, getting a yield is, is terrible. So um, a hedge against the dollar is becoming more um, obvious as something that, that that folks want, regardless of which in a class that they're in. So we're seeing all groups grow, but in general, this you know bringing investors into this space, you've got more aggressive and you got more conservative. Um, what's really interesting right now is that you're seeing increasing numbers of the more conservative plays starting to come in. So this is where you are seeing endowments and pension funds and insurance companies starting to say, hey, look, maybe we need to have an exposure to this asset class because of of what's coming down down the pike in, in the future. And as they look to get in with large, you know, $100 million plus investments, they're finding firms like ours that can service their needs, uh, regardless of whether it's trading or leverage or, or whatever it may be. Hey, Michael, anything you'd like to add? Um, I, I think what's what's been really interesting, um, certainly in, in 2013, 2014, um, it was really kind of dominated, even kind of on the OTC side, by a lot of like high net worth individuals or kind of the, the venture guys who was really who were really used to the, 
uh, you know, maybe Bitcoin does 100x from here or maybe goes to zero. Like that binary outcome in the investment kind of fit into a typical, you know, Silicon Valley like VC portfolio, right? So uh, in, in, in Bitcoin, they weren't really taking that much risk that was any different than the risk profile of the rest of their portfolio. Um, but it really conflicted with the East Coast guys who were like clipping the 7 to 8% in the equity market. Um, without a fear of going to zero, but they weren't going to get a you know whatever 50x 100x return on the entire portfolio, um, and you know the the evolution I think in the asset class um, and, it, and the fact that you know it survived. You know I don't know how many times Bitcoin has died in, in quotations in the media, but I think it comes back, it bounces back stronger, um, and we're holding events like this with Bloomberg, right? Um, so. I think that um, you know certainly the the narrative around you know why Bitcoin has definitely shifted to why not Bitcoin, um, and, and to Mike's point, certainly is kind of the macroeconomic winds are, are, are you know are, are behind it. Um, but uh, and I think the, the the beautiful thing about all of this is that this is a global thing. We talk we focus a lot on kind of the micro strategies and kind of the squares. Um, we've started to kind of work with corporations internationally um, that are putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet. So, um, you know, I think, and, and frankly, we talk about hedging against the US dollar. That narrative is a lot stronger abroad, um, where the fiat currency um, is certainly not as strong as, as even the US dollar, right? So, um, that narrative and that, that theme of kind of hedging against your own native fiat, I think, resonates actually quite well. Um, in sort of non-USD countries. And, uh, you know, it's really interesting what you said, Michael, about sort of international growth. And I, I would love to find out sort of where, you know, if we look at different geographies, where do you see the most growth and, and why? It's it's early, right? I think, you know, um, I mentioned microstrategy earlier. I mean, that really kind of kicked off the corporate treasury wave, I'd say. Um, and so we're really only talking about data that we have in the last six to nine months, frankly, um, of, of trying to see what this is. And and I think the the the, the momentum has certainly picked up in the last two to three months. Um, but, you know, in, in the last week and a half, we work with, you know, a company in, in South America. And we also work with a company in Southeast Asia. Um, so it's hard to kind of talk about geographically, where are they based? But I think what you'll find is from an industry perspective, you're going to find kind of the more tech firms, fintech firms, or kind of companies operating in that realm to be more receptive to it um, at this point in time. Um, you won't, uh, we, you know, and, and whereas, you know, a company is kind of in the industrial world, um, it may be a lagger um, in terms of trying to adopt Bitcoin kind of at, you know, at any level on their corporate treasury. And Mike, anything you'd like to uh, talk about there? As you start to talk internationally, the, the regulatory environment gets splintered really fast. So, you know, you kind of have to look at each region uh, by region. And you, know, you can start with different types of services, right? So, you know, what's, what's required from a, a custodial perspective? What's required from a trading perspective? What's required from a lending perspective? Uh, so we've got offices in Singapore. We've had that for quite some time. We've, we're working with Maz. We're uh, we've got our applications in to, to be able to provide all these services, but it's actually a little bit behind our U.S. efforts. Despite that, we actually do 50% of our business abroad. Um, we've also got our BaFin license, which we're got, grandfathered in on in Germany, you know, to help with our, our EU efforts against Switzerland and things like that. So uh, and Mike's right. Michael's right. There's a tremendous amount of uh, international demand. We see it uh, from all over the planet, South America, uh, Africa as well. Um, and, uh, and each one's emerging slightly differently. Um, each one has a strong consideration for what is, you know, the regulated kind of custody that's underneath it, which we find to be one of the most challenging pieces. You know, having uh, ultimately your private keys in the U.S. is a possibility, and some, many, opt for that. But most actually want to see those private keys being held within their own jurisdictions and regions. Um, so we, we need to build out, you know, actual safety of, of keys abroad. Um, and, uh, and, and we do a lot of that in that business as well. And Mike, in terms of, um, you know, you mentioned regulations. So what kind of regulatory clarity do we still sort of need? I mean, what is missing in terms of regulation uh, and how soon do you think we'll get to the point where, you know, it will feel comfortable? 
Well, I think actually we have pretty damn good clarity today in the unit in the U.S. Um, you know, things are still emerging abroad. There's still a lot of rumors of, of things changing, but um, you know, regulators are getting educated about digital assets just like you know everybody else, and and that education has been growing pretty rapidly, um, especially in the last 12 months. Uh, I think one misconception is this need to regulate digital assets in a new way. It actually, you know, we should be looking at what's the activity of the participant. You know, are you in custody? Are you in trading? Are you in and apply the same types of rules we would apply to other asset classes. We've had some missteps like, you know, the bit license where uh, there's a, a new particular regulatory framework specifically for New York, specifically for digital asset um, companies, which isn't a burden on anyone else. We've also had some confusion on, you know, should travel be applied in a more complex way to digital assets than non-digital assets. I'd like to see the regulators, you know, kind of come to some normals, and I, I think they will, um, uh, where we're just looking at the activity of what's going on, applying equal rules across different asset classes. Um, so in the U.S., I think we're getting there. Abroad, I mean, it, it's a two-hour long topic, so <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> and Michael, anything you'd like to add in regulation? Yeah, you know, uh, Mike mentioned the bit license. Um, we're one of the the, the bit licensees, um, uh, being that we're headquartered um, in, in New York. Um, and, and certainly, I think a challenge from a regulatory perspective, like from a from an investor perspective, I think the rules are fairly clear. Like it's perfectly legal to go out and buy Bitcoin. Perfectly legal to to have Bitcoin custodied, investing in it, buying a trade, like all of that stuff. Um, I think there's there's regulatory clarity. Um, I don't really think there's a question around it. It certainly is a much more of a question for operators, um, like like Bitcoin and Genesis, frankly, to kind of figure out a lot of this stuff. And I think a lot of the challenge is that the regulation is kind of done at the state level um, in, here in the United States. Um, and certainly there's lots of challenges and kind of nuances and things to know if you operate in 50 states. Um, and knowing that one state may interpret something a little bit differently than another state, um, and certainly we have to—that's something we have to keep in mind. And, and while you know, kind of Bitcoin and kind of cryptocurrency, you know, um, as a whole is not regulated at the at, at the federal level, um, what would be certainly helpful domestically is for some level of harmonization of of, of rules. Um, I won't call it uniformity, um, but some level of, of harmonization, I think, would be certainly helpful for operators to want to follow the rules. It's just it's it's really difficult um, to like navigate kind of the the, the, the regulatory waters. And, and certainly, you know, your first question was about kind of differences between traditional prime brokers and kind of the crypto prime brokers. And in, in traditional world, you could do most of the PB stuff through a broker dealer. Um, you just kind of need one regulatory framework for for helping to do the trading, offering leverage, custodying assets, all of it. And in the United States, you know, uh, you can't do that. Um, there's regulatory capital rules that kind of apply to crypto that make it impossible, frankly, for a broker dealer to operate like a lending business. Um, and then there's lots of questions around custody non securities um, through a broker dealer. Um, as you know, uh, in, in trying to think through the net capital implications and things like that. So um, there's lots of things about the asset class that make it difficult. Um, so and, and I think making it easier and clearer for for how to do this kind of the right way. When frankly, you know, Mike and I, we both run businesses that are looking to follow the rules. Um, we just want to kind of know what the what the rules are and and, and clarity on the operator side. I think would be extremely helpful. And uh, and I was wondering, so um, how how do you think about tether? Is that something that uh, you know you allow customers to to deal with? And sort of how do you think you know um, what is your sort of longer term view of of of, of stable coins and how that whole space is going to develop? I don't know if who wants to take that question. Sure. So, so stable coins are actually an important part of the, the ecosystem, um, and I think they're getting better all the time. I mean, Tether started, um, and it's had, had some questions, you know, obviously the, the um, New York uh, disputes that was just, you know, mostly resolved this last week uh, it, is important. Uh, we do allow our clients to, to pick what stable coins they want to use. I mean, our job as a custodian is safekeeping, uh, and whatever you give us, we're going to keep it safe, and we're going to make sure that uh, you get it back. So we don't have a problem there. 
But the good news is like there's a number of stablecoin efforts that are evolving, and eventually this will evolve into to CBDCs as well. But uh, you know, USDC I think is doing a great job here in in the U.S. You got the Paxos dollar as well. Um, so even if you don't like tethers, um, there's there's a lot of other alternatives. But so far, Tether has been uh, tremendous, um, especially out in Asia. I mean, it's, it's a core backbone of, of what's used to move digital assets around. And as long as the people have confidence that they want to use it in the trading, um, they will. So, so far, I mean, regulators have taken a lot of look at it, had a lot of scrutiny on it, um, and clearly it's passed muster uh, so far. Yeah, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with Mike on, uh, on Tether. I think the outcome was it yesterday, um, kind of the, the – the, the resolving the, the the dispute with the New York um, AG between uh, Bitfinex Tether and, and the New York Attorney General's office, I think was extremely positive for the space. Um, not just because Tether is such an important kind of part of kind of our ecosystem, but I think the, the, the judgment and kind of the agreement was more like surveillance, more clarity, more audit information that'll be supplied um, about, uh, you know, kind of dollars backing Tether. Um, and so I think it actually gives the market even more confidence um, now that there's going to be um, like an audit conducted and data shared um, regarding kind of the reserves backing backing the USDT. So I think it's a, it, it was a win all around. Um, on stable coins largely, I think it's been a tremendous evolution um, and really, really important. Now, a, a, you know, a key, key infrastructure. I mean, Mike mentioned USDC. Um, I, and, and, and for us, you know, we're coming fresh off of a, uh, you know, was it a, a, the, the Fed was down yesterday? Um, and we couldn't send, receive kind of like Fed wire transactions yesterday. Um, but uh, we were able to perfectly settle trades in USDC all day long uh, without kind of the interruption. So I think there's a lot of innovation kind of happening. Um, and USDC is also is, is a regulated, audited um, stable coin. Um, and so, you know, I think there's certainly going to be, as Mike mentioned as well, um, sort of a carryover into the CBDC, to the central bank digital currency world as well, um, because the value of the digital dollar and kind of the utility of it, frankly, is is so strong. What about, uh, how do you think about ETF? Uh, you know, how soon might we have them? And, you know, how might you play in this space? Well, internationally, they're coming faster than here. Uh, Canada and Europe both have uh, ETFs available to, to their, their clients today. Uh, we've got uh, a couple of new applications here in the U.S., which I think is going to have a positive result this year. Um, it's clear there's demand from the retail level uh, to have direct exposure through your broker's account to, to an ETF backed by, by Bitcoin and other assets. Um, so uh, I, I think what we've been building actually is exactly what the SEC wants to see. Uh, of course, we talked to the SEC um, and, and were consulted many times about, you know, what they need. Um, a couple of years ago, they said it was about custody. Um, I think these issues are solved and we will have, have an answer. Of course, it doesn't move as fast as we'd like. So, I don't know, I'm roughly predicting the end of the year, but, but frankly, I'm not sure anyone has perfect insight maybe other than the SEC. Um, and a question from the audience. Um, any thoughts on uh, prime brokerage's effect on volatility? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, so, uh, I, I think that over time, um, uh, you know, Bitcoin certainly while, um, the, the prices and kind of the volatility is certainly elevated kind of compared to kind of traditional asset classes, it has come down over time. Um, and I do think that, um, the institutional level volatility, um, which is, you know, for, for Genesis, that's all we face is kind of the institutional guys. Like no one is taking, you know, 100x leverage through Genesis to do anything. Um, it's much more tame, controlled um, in terms of the, the, the leverage that we're certainly kind of offered to this space. And frankly, um, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're taking collateral as well on the, on the loans that we extend. Um, so frankly, a lot of the cascading liquidations that you sort of see in the retail derivatives world um, is not really a thing kind of on the, the institutional side of the house. Um, our counterparties are meeting margin calls. They're able to, to top up collateral as they need to. Um, and we have never had a forced liquidation, you know, uh, through through Genesis for uh, one of our uh, le lending pro uh, programs and kind of counterparties. So I do think that um, you know the it's 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 more kind of the institutional 
um, manage leverage that is offered. Um, which uh, so I do think that uh, the kind of the proliferation of, of 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 that is actually going to help bring down volatility even further. Um, in the absence of institutional lending decks, they're forced to kind of go the that you know the the the, the retail leverage platforms. Um, and that's where you see the the the, the you know the, the liquidations in in times of volatility. Thank you. And Mike, we have uh, about thirty seconds. Um, anything you, you'd like to add? Well, well just onto that, I think prime brokers are going to help reduce volatility. Um, you know, this is about the, the number one thing to reduce volatility is making sure that everyone has access and that the, the space can grow. Um, and that's what we're doing. And in, in fact, it's happening at, at volumes and sizes we've never seen before. You know, a billion dollar investment is a is a big deal. Um, and we've made that work. So uh, I think volatility is going down. Thank you. And uh, Michael, um, Mike, thank you so much for, for your time. Uh, um, it was so great to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. All right, I am here with uh, Michael Saylor. He is the CEO of Michael, uh, MicroStrategy and really a pioneer, I would say, in the sort of like current wave of Bitcoin because really the first public company late last year, middle of last year, to make a point about putting some of its treasury cash into Bitcoin. The stock has soared since then. Other companies have since followed suit. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Michael, uh, like I said, you were really a, a sort of pioneer in this uh, middle of last year. I think it was last summer saying you're going to invest in uh, Bitcoin, some of your cash. You've done it multiple times since then. You've even gone out and sold convertible debt. How many companies have you talked to? How many public company CEOs have you talked to since then, the last six or nine months or so, who are interested in sort of replicating what you've done? Well, uh, uh, quite a few, quite a few. I mean, I I can't really share my uh, my discussions with uh, public company right. officers, but it is popping up as a much greater trend uh, in the last six months, and I think it's coming to the forefront of the conversation with all companies, private and public. So you've been pretty clear on this idea that you're not in favor of holding uh, extra cash, uh, especially given uh, your views on monetary policy, uh, the dollar, and so forth. What is it, though, about Bitcoin specifically versus other alternatives or, say, distributing extra cash back to shareholders? What is it about Bitcoin specifically that, in your view, makes it a logical asset for uh, companies to at least put some of their money in? Well, uh, I mean, let's look at the big picture. I've been a public company officer for 22 years. When you could generate 5 to 6 percent short-term interest on treasuries, uh, and you thought that the cost of capital was 7%, then you didn't have to consider anything other than a conventional treasury strategy. You're maybe taking a minus 2% yield per year. I think that uh, when treasury, conventional treasury assets started yielding 2% and you had a cost of capital of 7%, which is the expansion of the money supply, it became a minus 5%. People, uh, they grit their teeth and they got through it. That was for the past four, five, six years. Now in 2020, we've seen the cost of capital explode. It's 25% money, monetary supply expansion. The treasury strategies are now zero, one, one, less than 1%. So you've got a minus, a negative real yield, minus 25%. That's the cost of capital. Okay, that's actually turning up the heat that's causing everyone to realize that conventional treasury strategies are broken. Now, what are you going to do? Look at the last 12 months, ROI, uh, Bitcoin is up 461%, S&P is up 25%. If you invested all of your treasury assets in the spider, in the S&P index, you kept right. up with the cost of capital. NASDAQ's up 53%. Biz te uh, big tech, their monopolies, they're extraordinary, they're staying ahead of the cost of capital. Treasuries down 7.7%. If you were holding long bonds like TLT, that's a disaster. Gold up 9%. It's also a disaster. It's not keeping up with the cost of capital. So why Bitcoin? 
Well, yeah, you can't hold tr conventional treasuries. You're looking at a negative real yield against the cost of capital of 15 to 25 percent a year. Right? right. I mean, I'm not a consumer. I have to control. I, I have to manage shareholder value. And if you want to maintain or grow shareholder value, you're going to have to grow your assets at a great at a, at a rate faster than the cost of capital. So your hurdle rate is 15 percent. Now, what are you going to do? It is, and I think, if, yeah, if you look, I mean, at, it is a different all, definition of cost yeah. of capital that you have than, say, like a traditional accountant would have. Right. I don't think so. I think that a lot of people think about inflation. I think CPI. The cost of capital has always been in, in a conventional environment, risk free, six, seven, eight percent. If you talk to any institutional investor in the past decade and you said, my idea is I'm going to invest your money at one percent or two percent or three percent interest, they would ask for it back. In fact, there's not a single institutional investor that can keep limited partner capital by promising one or two right. or three percent returns. So all investors know the cost of capital. It's about seven or eight. Look, if you look at the compound annual growth rate uh, of the S&P over a decade, it's 11.4 percent for the past decade. If you look at Nasdaq, it's faster. It's 17 percent. Big tech is better than the S&P. If you look at the compound annual growth rate of Bitcoin for the decade, it's 198 percent. OK, so why Bitcoin? I have to move my money. Look, either got two choices, decapitalize the company or right. invest the money into something which is going to keep uh, up with the cost of capital or exceed the cost of capital. So let's talk about giving the money back. Well, Joe. The road to serfdom would be for you to surrender all your assets and take a job working exponentially harder for cash, growing exponentially weaker. You, no family on earth would do that. No investor is going to give all their capital back to the limited partners, right? No endowment's going to work. No university, no, no company can function by surrendering all their capital and then working harder exponentially for a currency growing weaker. And one more point. The robots are taking over the country. We're automating everything. So for Amazon to succeed, 15,000 retailers are destroyed. For Google to succeed, 15,000 media companies are destroyed. For Apple to succeed, 15,000 device manufacturers are destroyed. So right. every company is competing against Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook. These companies are dematerializing their products and their ship. Microsoft can bundle a product, ship it to 80 million companies over the weekend. Now, how are you going to make money if you pretty much well, give up me, all your capital and you start working to create a new product to compete against Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, or Google when robots are taking over the world? Let me uh, let me let's break into a couple of things. So one question, of course, that people have about Bitcoin is, even though it has done uh, very well, the track record speaks for itself. It is also, we know it's extremely volatile. Historically, it's suffered big drawdowns. We don't know when the uh, next one is going to be. In 2017, it peaked around 20,000, got as low as 5,000, I think, uh, March of last year. Is there, a good, is there anything good about holding Bitcoin itself if it's not going up? In other words, during these drawdown cycles, is there anything about the asset that makes it an attractive thing for you to hold? It's an, first of all, it's, it's the, the hardest money on earth. It's, a, it's an institutional grade safe haven asset. It's, it's gold without all the imperfections of gold on a digital monetary network that moves at the speed of light that you can program uh, to, to do a million transactions a second. So Bitcoin is digital gold on a big tech monetary network. Why would you want it? You would want it be for the same reason that you want to run electric power to your city or you would want to run running water to your building because civilization is based on clean energy, clean water, clean communications, clean money, right? It, it is uh, an extraordinarily right. important thing. Now, uh, with regard to companies, I think the real issue here is, is if the if 
every currency is correlated to the dollar, right? I mean, they're all trading against the dollar. So if the dollar is weakening, every other currency is weakening, and then every stock and bond and commercial piece of real estate that generates fiat or US dollar cash flows or any cash flows in a fiat currency, they're all correlated assets, and they're all correlated ultimately to the dollar. So if we create 15% more dollars every year for the next 10 years, right. then you've got to discount the cash flows of every other instrument by 15% a year. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that 80 to 90% of the value in those instruments is going to be collapsing if the dollar collapses. So if you want to preserve shareholder value, you have to buy scarce assets. Now, well, me, I, I could look for baseball cards or Picassos yeah. or sports teams, but it's hard to buy a billion dollars of liquid, scarce but, trophy assets. So Bitcoin is the most liquid, scarce, uncorrelated asset that you can buy if you're trying to do this in a treasury. But let me, you know, you keep testing you on that. And we have a question from the audience about your measure of 15 percent cost of uh, capital and so forth. And. Others might have it less, as you said, in the past 7 or 8 percent. But a, a company that someone typically invests in, a publicly traded company, they don't typically think of them as an investment trust. And they think, you know, the real opportunity is not what they hold, but what they do. And lots of companies are doing well. I mean, you talked about the challenge of competing against Microsoft or Google or Amazon. There's a, numerous software companies, for example, that are listed that have had phenomenal years. Business is growing 50 percent year over year. For the, most businesses, don't people actually want to invest in the business itself as opposed to, say, the, some aspect of their capital structure? I think conventional treasury strategy is now intellectually and morally bankrupt, and it's a road to serfdom, right? And, and I think that uh, what you're going to find is increasingly it, there, there's haves and have-nots, right? There's the elite that have incredible power like the Googles and the Amazons and the Apples, and they have more money and more power and more distribution than God. And then you've got conventional businesses that have, have conventional cash flows and they're being increasingly marginalized. So uh, to ask those businesses to, to invest all their capital in a currency, which is de devaluing at 15% or 20% a year, is pretty much committing economic suicide. But the expectation, Again, it's the sorry. same thing as, why don't those investors give all their capital back to their limited partners and decapitalize no, under that strategy, again, right? Yeah, again, but again, the expectation I think most investors is not that they're going to hold most of their money in cash per se, but that their fundamental business operations are worth reinvesting. And I, when I look at the numerous companies that are surging, hitting all-time highs, a proliferation of software companies and banks and industrials, they're companies that are not holding a lot of extra cash in any asset, in any treasury asset. And so the, the question is, why should we evaluate companies based on what they have in their treasury as, assets versus what they can fundamentally invest in with their operations and the things that they actually sell? I think it's pretty clear that we have a Main Street versus Wall Street dichotomy here. And if you have uh, a company that is asset rich, then you've got a 25% boost due to money printing of the Fed over the past 12 months. That's the M2 money supply expansion, roughly. And if you have a company which is, which is cash rich and asset poor, your business is just getting exponentially harder, and any cash that you have is being degraded right. at the same 25%. The S&P is up 24.61% which means that if you want a proxy for cost of capital, if you invested in any kind of company that, that was up 5% over the past 12 months, you're not keeping up with even the index, right? right? So if you're, if you're an active investor, you're going to have to find a way to get above 24%. Let, let me switch gears for a second, and this is, I think, an important different dimension. It's different from sort of macro, which is that in the whole reason oh, we're Joe, having this can conversation— I make a, can I make a point? I don't think a company can be successful if it doesn't have a large asset portfolio in an environment where you've got such aggressive monetary expansion. If you had an environment where money was expanding at 0% a year, 
then you could, you could focus upon the manufacturing of things. But in right. an environment where the money is expanding at 20% a year, everything you're doing in the future is being discounted by 20%. So in essence, as the money supply expands, all the future activity of every business is being discounted until it exponentially goes to zero, which means that the only path you have in order to create or preserve shareholder value is to, is to forward finance your cash flows. Like you have to look out 20 years, borrow against 20 years of cash flows, and convert it into an uncorrelated asset, which is going to appreciate faster than the rate of money expansion. Otherwise, and you can see this in Venezuela or Argentina, right. the business as an enterprise or the enterprise value right. of the business goes to zero as the money supply expands. You don't have a choice. Oh. I want to switch ahead. gears for a second to another important dimension of Bitcoin. And part of the, we're talking here because there's obviously a lot of institutional interest in, uh, in the asset class or crypto, however you want to call it. But one of the d important things about Bitcoin is that I can send you a payment or you can send me a payment without the permission of any sort of third party regulator or bank or entity that could say no. The sort of pure peer to peer cash online. From a regulatory or institutional perspective, is there any anxiety about holding an asset which has so much ability to essentially evade censors, evade capital controls, evade uh, taxpayers? And are you worried about that uh, tension at some point down the road, the intersection of institutional holdings and the sort of like original cypherpunk roots of the currency? I think the underlying integrity of the network, which allows you to take personal custody of your assets, uh, it, it creates the, uh, the foundation upon which to create an institutional grade store of value. And without, without that integrity, you couldn't be sure that your custodians would treat you fairly. But having said all that, I think every institution is purchasing Bitcoin through through regulated custodians. Right. And so you're buying it in lieu of gold or uh, our choices, if we wish to avoid insolvency, are you buy gold, you buy a portfolio of stocks, perhaps you go and you buy a bunch of timberland or oil contracts or some kind of commodities. Companies have to become asset rich if they're going to prosper and 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 uh, maintain shareholder value. So Bitcoin is the highest quality property right. that they can buy. As uh, the, the regulatory environment is already pretty clear on this. I mean, AML KYC regulations have been applied across all of these exchanges. Right. I think that there's a little bit more parity and precision that will be delivered in the coming one to two years. I think that's going to be the green light for institutions to invest 10x to 100x more into Bitcoin. So I think it'll be good for the industry in general. Let me ask you, um, you know, if a, a CEO came to you and maybe they weren't that tech savvy or whatever, they said, how should I, I want to buy some Bitcoin I don't know how to hold it. How do you hold your coins as a company? Do you have access to the private keys or does it make sense for companies to just hold their Bitcoin with a third party custodian? No, no, I think for any kind of, for, for a private or a public corporation, if it's really a corporate entity, it makes sense to use an institutional grade custodian. And there's, there's a, a good dozen of them that you can choose from. If you go to our website or go to hope.com, we've got a, we've got interviews with uh, ten of the more notable ones in the marketplace. Uh, this is I think that the use the use of Bitcoin for institutions is going they're, they're going to access it through derivatives. They're going to they're either going to buy funds that are backed with Bitcoin like Grayscale or other kinds of funds. They may buy the underlying asset through an institutional grade custodian. But they'll fundamentally work at those three levels. I think that there are uh, individuals will want to take personal custody of their Bitcoin, and right. there'll be other entities that do that. And they they're the uh, the minority, but they provide the integrity to the system that keeps everybody else honest. And I think that's the important just, role they play. We just have a couple more minutes. I want to ask you: you you've done a few convertible debt offerings, and uh, the pitch is. Someone buys convertible debt from you, you buy Bitcoin. If that sends your stock price surging and your stock has kind of become a Bitcoin proxy, then the debt converts and that's a great trade. 
if Bitcoin falls, then there's uh, safety because you also have your business intelligence business undergirding the value of those cash flows. Is there a limit to how many more of those offerings you can do? Or do you see yourself continuing to sell more convertible debt to buy more Bitcoin? And how much could you see yourself doing? Our company has two strategies. One is to grow the enterprise software business intelligence business. And the second is to acquire more Bitcoin. And we've been pretty clear that we'll consider equity and debt financings or any or, and or sweet cash flows we have into buying more Bitcoin. My view is Bitcoin is the underlying base layer of an emerging digital monetary network. If I told you that, that one day there'd be a hundred trillion dollar market for Timberland, you might want to buy timber. And if you knew there's a hundred right. trillion dollar market for, for any other asset, oil or, or diamonds or name it, you'd want to buy a bunch of it. So we believe there's a hundred trillion dollar uh, total addressable market for a digital monetary network. It makes sense to buy as much of that asset class as we can. We think it's it's so we, should we expect more, uh, more convert should we expect more convert offerings in the future? I think we just evaluate the market, you know, and, and uh, our view is look for anything we can do that's accretive to our shareholders. And there are circumstances under which there, there are things that are accretive and there are circumstances under which uh, I wouldn't think so. And so you just have to stay tuned on that. All right. Michael Saylor, CEO of MicroStrategy, like I said, a pioneer in corporate adoption of uh, acquisition of Bitcoin. Thank you uh, so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Joe.
I want to welcome everybody back. My name is Valdana Hayrek. I'm a reporter with Bloomberg, and I'm excited to delve into our next topic, which is central bank digital currency, something that's gained quite a lot of traction over the last year. And uh, I want to apologize ahead of time. It's it's rather a very large topic, so we might be jumping from uh, point to point. But I want to give a quick overview. Uh, there's certainly a, a lot to talk about. But in terms of central bank digital currencies, or CBDCs as they're known, it's cash created by governments. They're not tied up with uh, a regular commercial bank. They represent to a lot of its fans a, a sort of a, a future of speed and, and efficiency. Um, and development and interest and research uh, of CBDCs has picked up over the last year. We now have some central banks looking into this and, and doing some research, our, our own central bank uh, included. Um, and they're not without critics. So there's a lot of issues over access and concerns over privacy and their potential to, to shake up uh, financial stability is, um, is, is another worry for a lot of people. So I'm joined today by two experts who will help us uh, break this break all of this down. Kai Sheffield is the senior director and head of crypto at Visa. And Sheila Warren is the head of data blockchain, digital assets, and a member of the executive committee at the World Economic Forum. So welcome to both of you. And, and thank you so much for joining us. And Sheila, I, I'd love to start with you. I know we were just chatting right before we, we got started with this, but I'm hoping to, uh, to get you to imagine that you are speaking with Jay Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. And if you had a chance to speak with him and you had to make the case for CBDCs, what might you, what might you say to him? What, uh, what might be the advantage of widespread adoption of CBDCs for, for governments looking to launch them? Thanks. Yeah. Well, I'd start by noting that as with any issuance of anything that is a new technology or innovation, um, we should always start with the problem that we're trying to solve. And so here, I think for the United States specifically, uh, those problems vary around the world. But for the U.S. specifically, uh, there are a couple of advantages I think a CBDC could confer, and uh, they're related. So one is around fraud reduction. Uh, we know that with COVID stimulus payments, as an example, there was a significant amount of fraud in the delivery of stimulus checks and things like this. Uh, a digitally issued dollar could actually help reduce the amount of fraud by making the money more traceable and more direct, ensuring it gets in the hands of those that are intended to receive it. Uh, secondly, which is really linked, is the programmability of money. So uh, one thing that cash can't do and that other methods that are not fiat uh, fiat uh, money maybe will not be as relevant for is this idea of programming money. So things like tax receipts, um, uh, even welfare payments that are meant to go for certain kinds of uh, goods and services, these things can be programmed into money that is that a CBDC could offer in that, in that context. And so you would have, again, more control to some extent over what people were spending this money on. Now, there are a lot of debates about whether that's a good or bad thing, but those, I think, are some of the advantages, perceived advantages, that a CBDC or a digital dollar, as people are calling it, could confer. And we have heard from Jay Powell actually earlier this week talking to the Senate and the House of Repre Representatives about exactly this. Um, but Kai, I, I'm, um, I'm hoping you can sort of uh, tell us a little bit more about what in practice, the adoption of CBDCs might look like. So I was speaking with a Bloomberg colleague of mine earlier this week, and, and she was asking me, well, what, what might this look like? Will it look like, you know, Venmo, something we're all really familiar with, except just tied to CBDCs? Or in practice, what does it look like? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a great question, and it's still really early in terms of thinking, how should CBDC be designed as a product? Uh, and we think there are, there are a number of really important principles that if a central bank chooses to create CBDC, that they should keep in mind. And you know, one, we think it should be accessible inside of you know, existing you know, commercial banks and fintechs and digital wallets. We don't think you should have to go and you know, download a, a, a new specialized app just to be able to, to get access to, to CBDC. Um, we think it should be able to be spent at every merchant. Uh, and so if you want to create something that has the utility and can be used as digital cash, you need to have acceptance. And so you need for it to be you know, integrated into the existing payments ecosystem. Uh, so we think it's really important that any central bank digital currency uh, is built through a public-private partnership. Uh, and there's ways for you know, consumers to be able to access it uh, within the existing uh, banks and, and payment products that, that they know and, and trust today. 
So, so if you were if you were telling my colleague about this, what might her life look like if we did have CBDCs? What 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 would be different about her life? Would it be easier to faster to make payments? What exactly does it look like? Yeah, so so I think that the question is really what are the use cases where CBDC can create you know better you know payment experiences, uh, and I think you know one helpful way to think about it is not looking at CBDC just in a vacuum. You know, we have to understand it in the context of stable coins. You know, stable coins kind of being an example of a fiat-backed digital currency that are being actively used today. Now, what are they being used for? You know, stable coins are being used very much for cross-border payments, uh, for B2B payments, for remittances. Uh, and so stable coins aren't being used, you know, to buy your coffee. Uh, they're being used for you know many new different payment flows, and so I think when when people talk about and think about CBDC, uh, it's less useful to think about this as is this just another way that you buy your coffee versus how can you upgrade payment infrastructure uh, to enable more efficient you know payment flows that are difficult today like cross border payments. Shayla, if we do have. Uh, central banks picking this up, and we start to see CBDCs actually developed and, and put to use. What might the power struggle look like uh, if we do start to see this being developed? Well, I think there's a really interesting question, you know, as to which country CBDC winds up being almost the most programmable, the most useful, and you know what it's being used for. And so I think you know we can't really distinguish um, the ease of use of these things. I think some of Kai's points uh, from the soft power elements here. And so I think that you know we certainly could see geopolitical fallout, let's say, uh, from competing central bank issued digital currencies that are. Uh, maybe rapidly, you know, um, dominating certain kinds of uses. For example, uh, that could be that could be really interesting, right? I think the easier that money is to use or a country's money is to use, that paves the way for certain kinds of advantages that we haven't really begun to imagine yet because we're kind of all operating in the same environment. Um, so I think that's that's one thing that could be interesting. You know, I also think that like, my view has always been that, you know, crypto, stable coin and CBDCs have different roles to play in a broader financial ecosystem. I think Kai is saying this is, is to some extent as well. You know, the, the, they're different things. And so uh, I think people often try to posit that one of these, there's going to be this big, you know, fight among CBDCs and, and Bitcoin or whatever. And I just don't see it that way. I see these things as, as all important and relevant and they're, they are trying to, they address different issues. And again, we should deploy them focused specifically on what problems we're trying to, what is the point of them? What is the problem we're trying to solve? Um, so I do think though, that there's some geopolitical you know, struggle that could come out of this. I think there, it's no surprise and no, you know, no uh, shock that part of the reason a lot of countries are looking at CBDCs more seriously now is because of what's happening in China and because of uh, DSEP and the experiments that China has been doing very openly um, in terms of their own digital yuan. So, uh, you know, there's a reason people are paying attention here, and I think it, it remains to be seen how it will play out ultimately. Yeah, and we and we do have some testing being done in China for a digital yuan. So, uh, it, it, in terms of those geopolitical issues that might arise, I mean, is there sort of a a, a balance of power to be had? It, it, does the does the dollar fall to the wayside if we do start to see a pickup of CBDCs from central banks all around the world, or or what does happen? Yeah, I just think these things are interrelated, right? So a CBDC's use is going to be predicated on how important that particular country's currency is seen to be. And so, again, there's a whole discussion we could have about dollarization of economies and whether that's ultimately a good or bad thing and for whom it's good and for whom it might be bad, right? So leaving sort of that very important discussion aside for the moment, you know, I think there are a lot of things that determine uh, soft power and the use of currency beyond the, you know, ease of use of the currency. But what I'm saying is I do think that there is going to be a practical element to this. And so if you have a currency that's already seen as quite strong uh, or, or powerful, right, in terms of being um, something that other economies want to peg to or whatever the reason might be, uh, and one of them is much, much easier to use than the other, you know, that is going to have consequences. What those consequences are are going to depend on a whole variety of factors. But, you know, to pick up on something Kai said earlier, I think it's just really important to not look at any of these things in a vacuum and to really understand that, you know, money, politics, these things really do go together. They're systems of power in our society. And so we can't be naive, you know, thinking that, 
uh, the issuance of a certain form of money, uh, the issuance of a different kind of fiat is suddenly going to dramatically change you know, anything about the way the world works uh, in the immediate short term. I do think, though, that there's, it's important to kind of have the understanding of what could transpire and be planning for that down the line. And I, I'm sure that that's exactly what the Fed is doing as they explore this digital, digital dollar project. And Kai, I, I know both of you were just saying there's a sort of uh, all of these things are interconnected and uh, cryptocurrencies and stablecoins and, and CBDCs. But if we do have CBDCs in the world, what happens to Bitcoin? What happens to cryptocurrencies? Do they sort of fall to the wayside because they lose out in terms of uh, you know the popular popularity contest, or or how, how do you see that developing? Yes, yeah, so I think between Bitcoin and, and CBDCs, they're completely separate products with completely different value propositions. Uh, and what we see today with, with Bitcoin is, you know, the point is that it is independent from governments and, and central banks. And it's, you know, we see most of the demand for Bitcoin is, is to hold it, you know, as digital gold and as a store of value. And so, you know, we don't see a lot of demand for, for people to spend Bitcoin. I think the idea of, you know, both stable coins and CBDC is really more of a payment technology and payment innovation where you can create these new form factors for fiat that can have new properties that can you know, lead to you know, new payment flows, uh, where Bitcoin is more of a savings technology uh, in a way that consumers and businesses are looking to store value. So they can sort of live side by side. You go ahead, Sheila. Yeah, I mean, there's again, there's no cage match right between Bitcoin and CBDCs. That's like that's not a thing. They're very, very different things, and they both have a role in the ecosystem. And I think, and stablecoin, by the way, I'd also throw in there. There's no like three-way cage match going on here. You know, these are different things, and they have different functions and purposes. And and I think Kai's exactly right. Like we 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 need to stop kind of conflating them and putting them all in the same bucket. And I think it's important for people, you know, who are talking about these things now to really understand the differences among them and to to not, there's not going to be this massive offboarding from Bitcoin into U.S. digital dollar, you know, when that, if or when that transpires uh, and vice versa, you know, people who are, who really want to know that their money is FDIC insured and government backed are not going to suddenly, you know, move over into Bitcoin. Um, so, so these things, they really are so, so distinct in terms of, of their function. And I think that it's really, it's exactly Exactly right. It's really about the form factor that we're talking about here. Like, what can you do with these things, and what can the technical innovation really provide? And and that's where I sort of started with my comments addressed to Jay Powell to your to your hypothetical, which is it's really about this programmability aspect, right? Like that is, I think, what CBDCs are are borrowing, if you will, from crypto and stable coins is this concept that we can now program money in different ways to make certain things easier or even possible. And we are getting some uh, questions from the audience about some of the risks associated with this. And I think we can sort of break it down into a couple different buckets, including some privacy issues. But Kai, I'm, I'm hoping that you can sort of touch on, on how potentially this might impact the role of commercial banks. Does it does it reduce their role? Do they get cut out of this? Or, or, or uh, maybe you can describe to us what you see happening if we do have CBDCs and, and um, what role commercial banks can play. If any, yes. So we think there's a really important role for commercial banks uh, within CBDC, and I think you know many years ago, if you kind of heard CBDC, you know, when people heard it, you know, what they thought was the idea of downloading an app from the central bank and having an account and a relationship directly with the central bank. Uh, but I think a lot of people across the world have, have realized that you know that's a, a really big challenge. You know, that central banks aren't used to doing you know customer service. Uh, you know, they're not used to managing direct relationships with consumers and having a you know, technology product that they're delivering. And so now we've seen a lot of the momentum and interest shift towards this concept of two-tier CBDCs, uh, where the CBDC would be distributed through commercial banks. And so you can imagine that the you know, digital currency wallet that the consumer would interact with, it wouldn't be provided by the Fed, it'd be provided by a commercial bank. Uh, so similar to the way that cash you know, is distributed uh, through commercial banks uh, across the world, you know, CBDC could be distributed through both commercial banks uh, and fintechs. But we think that the really important consideration here is commercial banks have to be ready. Uh, and so this is something where you know, Visa has a unique perspective because we talk to you know, the most conservative, uh, slowest moving commercial banks to the kind of innovative you know, high tech fintechs and crypto companies. And they're all different places on this spectrum of digital currency readiness. 
and who's going to be ready to have a wallet that consumers can use. And it's really important that central banks consider they can't just say, we want to do CBDC and it's here tomorrow. They need to have a way that commercial banks can participate and have those commercial banks be ready to be able to distribute and offer products around that CBDC. So, Sheila, I'd love to uh, hear from you on this as well. It, it, does that mean that discussions uh, about um, commercial, co commercial banks losing out on this, are those maybe fears a bit overblown? You know, I would say so. Uh, you know, certainly our view is that every actor in an ecosystem is going to have a role to play. Uh, and I think that we're still sorting out a little bit, you know, where where the public sector ends, the private sector begins, if you will, or what effective collaboration between those two, two groups can look like, those two groups specifically, uh, particularly when it comes to the commercial banking sector. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's a fair characterization. I think that, again, like with many things in this space, there's a, a lot of drama that when you kind of really look at it, doesn't necessarily exist. And it's really just sort of ordinary kinds of concerns that come up anytime there's a new innovation, right? You're sort of carving out a, a lane and figuring out, you know, what, what makes the most sense and what's going to work together in this in this broader ecosystem. And I think that's just what's happening here. I think it's a very normal and natural uh, evolution, you know, as we get more serious and more sophisticated and as the technology and the innovations here mature a bit. Uh, so I, I, I don't see anything here that's a, that's a cause for, you know, <laughs> for, for concern or for, for drama. What about uh, privacy issues where you have this sort of um, the, the fear that you're going to lose out on the anonymity with, with, that you might have with cash? Yeah, well, you know, privacy, it's a design question to a large extent, right? So um, people have this concept that, for example, Bitcoin is totally anonymous when in fact it's pseudonymous, right? So there's a lot of misconception, I think, about these things. But certainly, you know, I think one of the things that's talked about a lot is, you know, uh, oh, if we have a digital yuan, is that going to be lead to a surveillance state? You know, these kinds of questions come about. These are design questions. And so there is a certain amount of privacy that can be embedded in uh, any particular issuance of a, of a currency, a digital currency, and that's a decision that's going to be made by the issuer. Uh, and so there, there is, uh, I think there are legitimate concerns, but I think that my hope is that there'll be transparency about the level of privacy that is baked into each of these different offerings and consumers can make their decisions about which are going to suit their needs. Um, but I think that what we should be asking for really is the considerations of these things to align with um, expectations that people ordinarily have. Uh, but fundamentally, look, I mean, you know, is anything ever going to be as private as my handing you a dollar and walking away? I mean, I don't think so. And as, as many have said, you know, if you were to design cash today, physical cash, there's no government on earth that would be that would be down with that, right? That would, that would jump on board with that plan because it provides this kind of absolute privacy. So these are things we need to be considering, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be exploring where we can bake privacy by design into a particular um, offering uh, and do the best that we can to ensure that we are preserving the aspects that are really important to the functioning of an effective system. Kaya, I'd like to switch gears a little bit here. I'm hoping you can talk about who potentially might be the winners in, in a world of CBDCs. I think one important constituency for, for CBDC that, that isn't often discussed are, are developers. Uh, and I think what we've seen with stablecoins is they've really become a developer platform uh, where they've almost been this like open source API for dollars where there's this vibrant global developer ecosystem across the world uh, building new digital wallets, building new financial protocols on top of them. And that's leading to significant innovation and that's great for consumers and, and businesses. So I think with CBDC, it's important to figure out, you know, what role can developers play? You know, how can you create a developer ecosystem and make it easy for them to, to come in and build uh, and I think if, if you can create that ecosystem, you know, that benefits, you know, consumers and, and businesses because you'll have new innovations that emerge from it. What about in terms of, uh, you know, this race between countries to try to be the first to develop this? So I, I know I already referenced uh, Jay Powell's remarks earlier this week, but he said, you know, there's potential pitfalls in, in getting this done as quickly as possible, that, do, that moving rather quickly is a bad uh, bad idea. So do you feel that there's any drawbacks in terms of um, moving maybe not as hastily as some would like on this or or what what might be the pitfalls of not developing it as quickly as as uh, you know CBDC fans might, might like? 
You know, there was a lot of criticism early on around uh, the U.S. is so behind and falling behind and behind behind. And what I always kind of reframed is it, you know, the U.S. was late to the game, but the amount of resource that the U.S. can, bring, the United States can bring to this question and, and just the weight of, of the issuance of something like, you know, a, a CBDC um, that's, that's fiat American dollar, you know, you can't discount that. And so, I think, again, I think this race, you know, concept is somewhat overblown. You know, I think, again, these are going to be very different things. Uh, we're, let's just be clear what we're talking about here. We're really talking about digital yuan and digital dollar, right? So they're going to be very different things. They're going to have different, well, privacy elements, for example, right? They're going to have different um, immediate uses. They're designed for probably different purposes. I mean, one imagine. So, so again, I find this kind of thing a little, a little silly, to be honest. You know, I think that, um, countries are going to get there when they get there. I would certainly say at this point in time, any country that's not looking at this space very, very closely, and I don't know of one that's not looking at this very closely, to be clear, uh, is definitely, I don't know what's going on with that. That's a clear mistake. Um, but these decisions are, are not things that should be taken lightly. And I think there are tremendously significant design decisions that need to be made that have to reflect the priorities of a particular uh, political regime, you know, to put it really bluntly. And those are not things that should happen quickly or overnight. So I, I'm generally in favor of, you know, being clear about the plans, being clear about timelines, uh, but taking the time to ensure that what you're building is going to be inclusive. I don't see any point in building something that's just going to kind of service the existing systems and not actually add benefits, you know, to whether that's bringing more people into systems that need, to, that should ought to be brought along, giving them more opportunities. If we're not doing those things, then what's the point of this? It shouldn't just be like a kind of a fad that we're responding to. So so I tend to think that, you know, careful, thoughtful design is never a bad thing. And if that means that one thing goes first and one thing goes a little bit later, I, I personally don't feel that that is something to be concerned about. I think it's something to probably embrace because there's reasons that those things are, are probably happening. And so, in your opinion, it, Jay Powell moving a bit slower on this is, is all right. I think it's fine. You know, I think that there was, I mean, we happen to know that there were a lot of people at the Fed who were paying a lot of attention to this for quite a while. So they're not starting from scratch, right? There are people who have deep expertise, both technically and from policy perspective on this topic that are, have been at the Fed for quite some time across the different branches. So just because they're publicly saying something now doesn't mean that for a while there hasn't been a lot of exploration and thought being put into some of this already, right? But these are these are decisions that I think are, are potentially quite significant. So so uh, again, you know, I think that there's a certain move fast mentality to things, and I think that's very true in the in the crypto space for a variety of reasons. When it comes to fiat money, I do think it behooves you know any system to be thoughtful and careful about that. Yeah, and, move and fast and, and break things. There, there's still so many open questions and design considerations. Um, exactly. And just the question of like, what is the use case? <laughs> like, what use case are you focused on? What are you solving for? So you can't move forward and build something when it's not clear here specifically the use case. Uh, and I think the other kind of benefit here is that the private sector is moving rapidly and is innovating. And I think a lot of the innovations coming out of the private sector, one, are a you know fantastic you know area to observe and watch how these technologies are being used, and then how could they be incorporated into potential CBDCs in the future. And so all of this infrastructure is being built out, you know, for stable coins, you know, wallets, custodians, exchanges. So it's not that, you know, there's no innovation, nothing is happening. And I think it's better to take time and see kind of what can the private sector develop and then what role should central banks play over time. So Kai, can you actually, I, I'd love to follow up on that. Are there any technological barriers that we still need to overcome to, to, to start developing CBDCs? So I, I think about CBDC more as, you know, fundamentally a new form factor for money that is a digital bear asset controlled by a private key. And I feel like that's what makes it a digital currency. If you're not talking about a bear asset controlled by a private key, then you're talking about something else. You're talking about RTP and kind of other payment systems. And so there is still a lot of technology and infrastructure that has to be built out to be able to support this new form factor for money. Uh, so you need the ability to securely manage you know, private keys you know, if you have a digital bear asset. And I think that's you know, being built out rapidly in the private sector, but will still take time for you know, every bank to be able to integrate a digital currency wallet 
you know, these are things that, that are going to take years are going to require, you know, global trusted brands and technology providers to help with. Shayla, does the pandemic in any way alter the, the timeline that we might see this happen? Does it speed it up potentially? Well, I think it's sped up the discussions internally, whether it speeds up the build. I think it's, you know, Kai's exactly right. You know, I still, I still haven't heard, and maybe I just missed it, articulated exactly what the initial use cases would be, you know, for this. And I think that's really important. So uh, I tend to, I hope that, you know, the, there would be a, a strong element of financial inclusion in this and thinking about parts of our society uh, that have been left out of traditional systems and the wealth creation that can occur in those systems. Um, but I, I you know I haven't really heard that. And so I think the pandemic has spotlighted inequity in our society in a very powerful and a way that's impossible to ignore. I think that, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the fraud, you know, that, that occurred in these stimulus checks and things like this is known and documented. And so I think that there's uh, there are use cases that were highlighted by the pandemic. Whether those are the use cases that the Fed intends to address, you know, I, I don't know. So I, I, I'm not really sure how to answer your question. I do think that um, this pandemic in general has caused people to be more creative in thinking about what you might program into these new form factors, right? Like what that might look like, which I think is a good thing. I think it's spotlighted where inefficiencies and other things are hugely problematic. Um, but is, you know, is this the answer to those things? I mean, it depends on how you roll it out, right? So there's a lot of consideration that has to happen there. So has it made it, has it made the issue, the, the building of it all that faster? I couldn't possibly say. Has it made the conversation more amplified? Absolutely, as you would expect. And so if we are thinking about some of those inequalities, as you just mentioned, who, what part of the population might potentially be left out? I know oftentimes we hear, you know, somebody who doesn't have a smartphone might not be able to participate. Is that sort of how you're thinking about it? Well, I think you can't separate issues of financial inclusion from historical, you know, reasons that that, that exclusion exists. And so I do think things like digital divide are critical to this, you know. So we talk a lot about uh, when we talk about financial inclusion, we're often talking about people that are right on the border of the financial system, not those who are really outside of it. Um, and those people exist in our society as well. We tend to think of them as people in other countries or whatever. We have these kinds of, you know, uh, culturally, frankly, absurd notions about where where exclusion is happening. But it's happening, you know, in my city of San Francisco. I can tell you very clearly. Um, and so I think that uh, we, we have to we have to kind of consider, you know, what are the what are the barriers? What are the infrastructure barriers? What are the educational barriers? What are the access barriers? And what are these other things? And it needs to be a holistic holistic view. So it's not just that oh we can roll out this new thing and suddenly you know everyone's going to be great and it's all going to be you know fine and dandy. That, that's not how any of this works. Uh, and there's history, years and years and decades of development ec economists and you know others who focus on economic justice that could that could point the lie out there. So in my mind, you know, anything that's that's going to have have actual impact in helping um, marginalized members of our society is going to have to be a much more systemic examination of how this particular thing, how, you know, a CBDC uh, would actually fit into a broader overhaul of our system. Um, and that's something that I certainly have not seen as much discussion as I think we should be having about. Hi, I'd love to know if, if you guys are having these discussions at Visa. But I know we only have about a minute left, uh, uh, and we do have some questions from the audience. So I, I'd love to um, to get to at least one of these. So uh, somebody wants to know, do either of the panels believe that CBDCs will be backed by Bitcoin, that governments will actually be buying Bitcoin? So, Sheila, maybe we can go with you. And apologies, just a minute left. Yeah, those are very different questions. Um, do I think governments will be buying Bitcoin? I'm sure there are sovereign wealth funds that own Bitcoin, whether they'll admit it or not. You know, so that's kind of one question. Do I think a CBDC would be backed by Bitcoin? I guess that's I'm, I'm not really following that because the the premise of a central bank digital currency is that it is it's fiat money. So it is it is the same thing as the paper dollar you're holding. It's just a digital version of that. So uh, no, I don't I don't think that that would be something that would happen unless there's some new product that's conceived of that probably has a different name. <laughs> I'd love to give maybe 15, 10 seconds to, to each of you for final thoughts. And I realize time has run out quickly. So yeah. thank you both. Yeah, I, I just thought that yeah, I, I think there needs to be public private partnerships. And, and I think we're seeing, you know, a ton of activity and innovation with stable coins. 
Uh, and there's a whole private ecosystem that's here to, to help central banks you know, figure out CBDC. Shayla, final thoughts? Yeah, I just think that we need to be very thoughtful about all of this and engage a variety of actors, public partnerships, civil society, academic thinkers, you know, a lot of uh, activists, frankly, we need to be thinking about people who represent communities that we want to serve, uh, bring all those people into the conversation. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Ildana, for the intro. Hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, in this next conversation, we're going to be discussing the regulatory outlook for Bitcoin and crypto assets in the United States. Uh, we have a great panel today. Joining us are Lewis Cohen, co-founder of DX Law, Colleen Sullivan, co-founder and CEO of CMT Digital, and Peter Van Valkenburg, research director, Coin Center. Uh, so we find ourselves in a kind of an interesting uh, point in time to be having this conversation. We're coming off four years of the Trump administration's relatively laissez-faire approach to not just Bitcoin regulation, but sort of financial regulation more broadly. We have a unified democratic government, and we're, we're poised to see a lot of change in the United States. Uh, so, so to kind of get um, the audience's feel on that, we polled a, a, a Twitter audience uh, to ask them a couple questions about Bitcoin regulation. So our first question is, uh, what's the best way to regulate the crypto industry? Uh, we gave uh, the audience a couple options, a bank license, money transfer license, self-regulation. Uh, none of it appealed to them. Uh, far and away with 55% of the, of the vote is no regulation needed. Uh, we think that that highlights a little bit of cognitive dissonance in this space uh, because our second question uh, asks, what is the biggest obstacle to widespread institutional adoption of cryptocurrencies? And the, the top answer there is that the regulatory framework is not working. Uh, so whether whether you think the regulatory framework is already too burdensome uh, or if you think it needs to be abolished entirely, uh, probably uh, up to the perspective of, of who you ask. Um, but luckily, we have three experts to give us their opinions today. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to go first to Colleen, who is our panelist, perhaps with the most day-to-day -day interaction with uh, crypto asset trading, and, and just ask her simply, Colleen, do you think the regulatory framework is working? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, if I had a magic wand, what I would do is, you know, I would start with self-regulation probably eight years ago, and then there would be some federal legislation specific to the crypto industry. It's a brand new asset class that should not have, you know, 20th century rules um, applied to 21st century technologies. But of course, that's not where we are. Um, I think the answer is complicated. Um, and I thought maybe I could highlight some of the things that the regulators are trying to grapple with um, in that context. So um, the first is the crypto genie is out of the bottle. You can't put it back in. So this is a global phenomenon. And there's obviously no Bitcoin or Ethereum CEO to call if there's a problem. It's just software running on the internet. So um, you know, if you think about regulators or policymakers trying to use US entities effectively as choke points, the activity is not going to stop. It will just move peer to peer. Um, and I think of it like this. If you think about Tesla, you know, a, a U.S. company trading on U.S. markets, it's really a U.S.-centric thing. Um, and it's really hard for non-institutional players outside of the United States to access it. Cryptocurrencies, of course, are the exact opposite. Um, take Bitcoin, for example. It's fungible all over the world, accessible by everyone. So there's only so much any one regulator in any one jurisdiction can do. Ripple is a good example of this. Um, as People know the SEC filed a complaint over the holidays, and it caused a number of exchanges in the United States to delist Ripple, um, even prior to Ripple responding to the SEC. But you know what? Ripple's up 84% over the last 12 months. So what does that tell us? It tells us that XRP, while it has suffered some damage in the United States, it's far from dead due to the global nature of the asset and its global accessibility. Um, you know, if this type of action had happened against a U.S. publicly traded company, the United States is the only geography that really matters. But here, it's just one of many, many different geographies. So it's complicated. So you bring up you bring up a great point, which is that crypto assets they are different from traditional financial assets. They're based on a new technology. For the last call it decade, we've been trying to sort of 
uh, fit a, a, a square peg into a round hole and, and to kind of have existing financial regulators take the lead in whatever sort of piece of the crypto industry fits into their wheelhouse. Uh, and, and that, you know, has had its shortcomings, right? So we kind of have the potential for new legislation. We have a unified government. Democrats are in control. Um, there's, a, there's sort of a potential for new ideas to kind of come to fruition here. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll ask Lewis. Lewis, what do you think the prospects are for new legislation? And, and what do you think might be the contents of some of that uh, coming in the, in the next couple of months or years? Well, thank you. I mean, certainly uh, trying to prognosticate about what's going to happen in the new Congress in any area um, is, is very difficult. You know, we have, uh, you know, a, a near deadlock in the Senate and, and uh, very um, uh, So, you know, there are a lot of questions across the board in terms of legislation. There are also many legislative agendas that, you know, the uh, Democratic uh, side of the, the House and Senate are, are pushing forward that don't relate at all to digital assets. Um, and so I think there are, are certainly some reasons to be cautious about hoping for legislative solutions, you know, in the current Congress. That being said, on a positive side, um, you know, much of the potential legislation here should be relatively nonpartisan. What we'd like to see, as Colleen uh, uh, you know, if there is legislation, it's a legislation that helps make America serve this critical emerging technology and allows, you know, reasonable business to go forward without, you know, unduly jeopardizing, you know, consumers, investors, or others. And that should be something that both the uh, party and the, and the Republicans can get behind. So I'd be cautiously um, optimistic that perhaps in you know the latter part of this year we could see some some movement after other uh, legislative agendas come together. Um, there are a couple of pieces of legislation I'm particularly excited about. You know, one uh, Peter uh, Van Valkenburg was intimately involved with, which is the Digital Commodity Exchange Act. Um, another uh, I was. Uh, uh, Securities Clarity Act. We can talk about those, but I think if those were passed, we'd, we'd move things forward in an important way. Yes, I, I think that uh, myself and, and others agree that the prospects of, of legislation in the near term are, are pretty slim. Congress typically has bigger priorities, especially now amid the, the pandemic and, and the economic downturn, right? So it seems like uh, the near-term outlook is mostly going to lie with the regulators. And I know there was a, a, a relatively consequential rulemaking put forth at the end of the Trump administration uh, from FinCEN. Um, maybe uh, maybe I ask Peter's opinion on, you know, that regulation sort of fell short. There's, there's, a, there's a delay. It might be rethought under uh, a Democratic Treasury. Uh, so, so, Peter, tell us how you think that that might change from uh, the Republican proposal to a Democrat sort of final rule. Yeah. So, you know, it's important to point out that in America, we don't regulate technologies, we regulate activities. So we don't have like omnibus internet regulations, and that's by and large a good thing. But if people decide to do a certain regulated activity using the internet, we have regulations that apply. The same should be true of cryptocurrencies. We're not gonna regulate a whole technology like Bitcoin, that's nonsense in the American system, but we might regulate some activities that people do using the Bitcoin network, activity-based regulation. Now, the regulation that you're talking about is anti-money laundering regulation, nothing to do with investor protection, like what the SEC deals with, or consumer protection, which is what state money transmission licensing deals with. Anti-money laundering regulation is done by FinCEN, a subdivision of Treasury. And it's true that at the end of the Trump administration, we had a new rule proposed by FinCEN that concerned how exchanges need to collect information about their customers, AML KYC rules. So the first thing I want to point out to an audience that might be unfamiliar with this stuff is that Bitcoin has been regulated. Activities that people perform using Bitcoin have been regulated for anti-money laundering purposes since 2013. If you're holding other people's Bitcoin for them and sending it on their behalf, you need to register with FinCEN, know your customers, perform suspicious activity reporting requirements and other record keeping duties. Now, what the Trump administration tried to do at the very end of their term in a sort of midnight rushed rulemaking was say that these exchanges that hold people's Bitcoin for them, they don't only need to know their customers, they also need to know the name and physical address of the people their customers are paying on the peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin network. And that is, in Coin Center's opinion, and I think now widely regarded, a step too far. You know, this is all warrantless mass surveillance, and it's 
acceptable. We've accepted the fact that banks are going to spy on their own customers. But the notion that we'd have banks and other financial institutions not just spying on their own customers, but spying on their customers' counterparties is really just, you know, it's not tolerable in a constitutional system where in theory we should have a warrant requirement for a search or surveillance action by the government. And fortunately, you know, the rulemaking got slowed down at the end of December, at the end of the Trump administration, got pushed into the Biden administration, and then got extended for a full 60-day comment period. The original comment period wasn't even 15 days. It was a radically short comment period from an administrative law procedure. So it was really being rammed through. Now it's slowed down. And now we're actually quite optimistic that all we'll get from FinCEN as far as new rules for crypto is that if you're an exchange and your customer withdraws $10,000 or more, just like a bank might have a customer withdraw $10,000 in cash or more, it'll trigger a currency transaction report. It'll just say, my customer took this much money out and is moving it around on the peer-to-peer -peer protocol. It won't require the bank or the financial institution to identify the names and physical address of the people or, frankly, smart contracts and robots that their customers might be paying. It's something that will still allow law enforcement to get the information it needs to police crime on these networks, but won't destroy the viability of the technology or be a huge overreach into our personal privacy. Yeah, great. So that seems like a, a moderating effect, right, as the Democrats sort of take over from, from the Republicans, although by and large, Republicans didn't do a whole lot in the past four years on crypto asset regulation. Um, but uh, sort of on the other side of the coin is that uh, uh, the Biden administration is expected to nominate Gary Gensler to lead the SEC. Uh, he has a really strict enforcement record as um, at the CFTC, where he um, he oversaw the implementation of the Dodd Frank Act's really significant overhaul of the swaps market uh, after the financial crisis. So uh, I guess I'd go back to Colleen here and say, um, how are you preparing for a Gensler SEC, and what are you worried about? Yeah, well, similar to what Lewis said, you know. I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, the upside with Gensler is that he is substantively very familiar with the crypto space. He taught a course on crypto at MIT. Um, he, he really understands. I think on the institutional side and obviously the retail side, I do expect we'll see a Bitcoin ETF, and I think that will be welcomed by the industry. I think that um, one of the challenging aspects um, is, is going to be you know, Gensler is a progressive guy, right? And so you think about what is crypto all about, right? We're, we're building a parallel financial system next to the existing traditional financial system. And the hope is that like Bitcoin, it'll be open to everyone owned by no one. Um, and we've got this wealth gap in the United States that is increasing um, rapidly. And there's a lot of frustration from people, uh, right? rightfully, who want better access to the financial system. Um, sorry. Um, who want better access to the financial system. Um, we saw this very clearly with GameStop. And so democratization of this type of financial access, what crypto provides, you know, assuming proper guardrails are in place, is really something that a Democratic administration, Gensler, you would expect them to embrace. Um, and I think it's important to keep in mind that the crypto industry started from the bottom up. You know, this started with retail investors first, not the other way around. Um, and so in many respects, notwithstanding the rapid, you know, institutional involvement we're now seeing, it's really the people's financial system that we're trying to build. And so I think it's going to be tricky to look over at the space and say, well, everything's a security and maybe only accredited investors should participate when non-accredited investors built the system. So I think there's going to be this tension between, you know, for example, not taking a sledgehammer to decentralized finance and instead working with industry, engaging with industry, sharing what are the risks that the SEC is concerned about. And then it's incumbent on industry to figure out how to build the tools to help mitigate those risks. Um, I also think it would be absolutely fantastic if we see Gensler and Commissioner Peirce collaborate. And if we got some movement on Commissioner Peirce's proposed safe harbor, um, that, that could be naive thinking, but I'm a glass half full kind of person. So uh, again, cautiously optimistic. 
Yeah, I love your point about access, retail access, right? Um, this is by and large a retail-driven phenomenon. I think most people out there watching are, are probably thinking that um, approval of a Bitcoin ETF is, is a potential catalyst uh, for the asset class going forward. Um, I know that in the past, some of the reluctance to approve an, an ETF has been, uh, you know, it's been kind of uh, opaque. It's hard for uh, retail investors to follow this and kind of understand what is the obstacle. Um, uh, some of it had to do with uh, poor surveillance over the spot markets uh, or concerns that retail investors might, you know, lose their money if they invent, invest in this asset class. So maybe I'll go to Lewis and say, you know, what would be some of the signs that a Bitcoin ETF is making some progress? And, and what do you think a Gensler SEC is going to think about some of those applications? Yeah, so a, a, a new ETF application was recently filed. And I guess, you know, in terms of signs for prog of, uh, progress, I mean, we, we have to see how that uh, progresses. Uh, one very positive sign is that Canada uh, recently pr uh, approved one uh, Bitcoin ETF, and I understand is shortly expected to approve a second uh, Canadian ETF. Um, Canada has been a little bit of a proving ground for uh, the exchange-traded fund sector and, you know, in the past um, has kind of led the way, and um, the SEC has kind of taken into account. It doesn't drive SEC decisions, of course, but it is duly noted when a similar jurisdiction has made a move in that direction with similar investor protection concerns. Um, I think it will be uh, a bit of an uphill battle to get uh, an ETF approved here in the States. Um, I think, as you noted, um, you know, one of the concerns is what's, you know, loosely referred to as manipulation, and particularly vocal about um, the kind of uneven way in which the commission has applied concerns around, you know, the, the depth of markets and the ability to manipulate markets. And although they have, uh, the SEC has said no to other ETFs where there were, you know, similar concerns. They've also to ETFs that have probably much uh, shallower markets and easier to manipulate markets than Bitcoin itself. I think one of the other underlying uh, evil, though not clearly articulated, is um, if, a, if a Bitcoin ETF is allowed to go forward, and if despite everyone's hopes and expectations, we see a severe drop in the price of Bitcoin because of you know, exogenous events, um, there may be a concern that the government is in a position of being a buyer of last resort. And for all of us who live through the great financial crisis of you know, 2008, 9, 10, you know, we saw that the government was obliged to step in and be a buyer of last resort of a wide variety of assets. And I think there is a, a real reluctance to put in place, you know, the type of financial instrument that would, would you know, effectively make, um, you know, the Fed or another, you know, the Treasury or another governmental entity, you know, the buyer of Bitcoin at that uh, degree. And um, so, so I think there, you know, there are some, some definite, you know, questions around that. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, so speaking of this sort of like retail institutional tension, <clears throat> I want to go to Peter for a second here. Um, uh, just you kind of broadly speaking, conceptually, um, you know, is it better for regulators to prioritize institutional adoption of the asset class? Or is this like a, a whole new sort of financial system where they should really prioritize retail access? And, and how do you think a, a kind of one or the other approach might affect the, the asset class in the long term? I mean, you know, so Coin Center is a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C., and we're focused narrowly on defending people's freedom to innovate using the underlying technology. And so to some extent, that's more of a retail than institutional concern, although the presence of institutional parties is certainly good for the ecosystem. It brings a sort of gravitas and it brings a lot of capital into the system that can be used to build better technology. So I'm not sure I have an opinion about that, although just in general, I don't think the job of regulators is to sort of prioritize one investor over another. That's exactly the opposite of what we would want regulators to do. I think we just want even and steady rules of the road, the rule of law, you know, reasonably clear expectations of when you're gonna be regulated and when you're not gonna be regulated. Because when you're in that gray area, you run the risk of doing something that you thought was you know, sort of free and open for you to do, but actually suddenly you've transgressed the law and you might end up with strict penalties. To that end, um, state money transmission licensing rules are still actually kind of a mess in this country. Every state has a different definition of money transmission. Some of them include um, certain Bitcoin related or crypto related activities within that definition. 
even if you're pretty sure you are a money transmitter because you're a company like Coinbase, you've got to go through this ridiculous process of getting licensed in 53 states and territories in order to do an activity that is digital and global by default. So I think we could have much more reasonable regulation, not from a privileging retail investors versus institutional investors standpoint, just from a rationalizing regulation so that it's applying at the scale that makes sense. And the scale that makes sense for things like consumer protection is a federal regulation, not a state by state regulation. So as Lewis said, one piece of legislation that we are kind of excited about, although I do think it's hard to get anything through Congress because um, this is probably not a priority. But a piece of legislation we are excited about is the Digital Currency Exchange Act, which would create an optional spot market license category for, for exchanges to get regulated by the CFTC instead of having to get all the money transmission licenses. So this would be easier for the businesses that are helping people buy and hold Bitcoin, and that's good for those businesses and good for their retail customers to the extent that they're uh, acting as a proxy for their interests. But this is actually also good for consumer protection because we would get a global view of how these companies are operating rather than just a view of what they're doing with their customers in Idaho, which makes much more sense for a global technology. Additionally, we'd get some spot market supervision and market surveillance, which is the exact thing we need, you know, from a regulator like the CFTC that's used to that kind of market surveillance in the derivatives context. And it's the exact thing we need in order to have more comfort with respect to manipulation of the price and things like that, which might ultimately lead the SEC to do something like approve an, EF, an ETF because they feel like there's now better market surveillance. So I think that is a win-win for everyone. Um, again, Congress is a is another question. <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely think consumer protection will drive a lot of what the Gensler SEC does, and and so in the in the previous administration, that consumer protection angle was was at least in my opinion focused a lot on uh, some of these ICOs and other sort of offerings that that were um, deemed securities uh, as as kind of a way of, of protecting investors, including XRP. And I know everyone on the panel has a lot of opinions about whether or not crypto assets should be securities. Um, so maybe just quickly, Lewis, tell us whether you think that XRP ruling might change uh, under a Gensler SEC and then what that kind of means for stable coins and, and other products like that moving forward. Gosh, that's not a quick one. I'll, go, I'll go try and go as simply as I can. I think the, the point Peter made is one that um, we have this lacuna in our regulation around uh, digital assets. Um, you know, things like Bitcoin are readily acknowledged not to be securities. There's no, as Colleen said, there's no CEO of Bitcoin. But with other assets like XRP, it's more complicated. Um, the XRP is simply uh, what is a, a digital asset? It's a string of code. In and of itself, it is unequivocally not a security. Um, however, the cost of the way um, digital assets like XRP are sold, um, even after they're resold and resold and resold in markets, there is a clear correlation uh, of the value of the asset with its progenitor, you know, sponsor company, in this case, Ripple Labs. And Uh, that is tradable by retail people and has an important externality, which is its you know potential um, you know dependence on or at least uh, involvement of some company. Again, in the case of Ripple Labs, um, that would be um, that would be uh, XRP in the case of um, the Ripple Labs case. Um, I don't anticipate um, the. Gensler run SEC taking a different position than um, the, um, uh, the Clayton run SEC did. I think the enforcement staff of the SEC. All right, it looks like we're having a little trouble with Lewis there. Um, maybe let's put this all in, into perspective here. Um, sort of what does this mean for, for U.S. competitiveness going forward? Colleen, I know that you, you trade a lot in these, in these markets. Um, where do you see liquidity right now? Um, is it in the U.S.? Is it offshore? And does it, you know, establishing a better regulatory framework bring some of that to the United States or other sort of more regulated jurisdictions? Yeah, so I think right now we're sitting somewhere in the middle between, you know, regulated exchanges and unregulated exchanges and where that liquidity lies. Um, I will say, you know, it's challenging for trading and investments firms that are based solely in the United States without, you know, offshore offices. So, for example, while CMT is headquartered in Chicago, we also have offices in London and Frankfurt. And um, you know, having those offshore offices is helpful to us, and I'll explain why. 
Um, so if you're solely based in the United States, especially post BitMEX, it is very difficult to access liquidity on non-U.S. exchanges. Um, you know, post BitMEX, many of these exchanges really tightened their KYC, AML policies and procedures. And if you have traders physically sitting in the United States, you pretty much can't trade on those exchanges. And to your point, that's where most of the liquidity is still right now. The same holds true from an investment standpoint, especially if you're looking to invest in tokens. Most deals exclude U.S. investors from participating. So this regulatory kind of unclarity that we have right now is challenging for firms building businesses in the United States if this is the only jurisdiction that you reside in. Um, I wanted to just quickly pick up on something that Peter said, because I think it's really important. You know, Peter mentioned that FinCEN started regulating the space in 2013. And at that time, really the only asset that FinCEN was looking at was Bitcoin. We now have over 6,000 different cryptocurrencies. To Peter's subsequent point, with this new legislation and having the CFTC step in and take a look at oversee the spot market, you know, many of these crypto assets really will be utility. If you think about where this is going, you will have tokens powering creator social gaming economies. Those are, in our view, commodities. You know, we're all commodities. The only things that aren't commodities are movie receipts and onions. So, you know, that seems to be a very good solution to some of the ambiguity that we're dealing with today. Yeah, and so you bring up a great point, which is that, uh, you know, we need to be open to the to the potential for technological innovation here uh, as sort of an asset class, but also as potential infrastructure for sort of a, a, a future uh, sort of new financial system, right? Um, so, so I have a question for for all of you, but maybe we'll start with Peter. Is is do you think that the Biden administration and and some of the regulators that that he may appoint um, are they are they open to the idea that that this comes down to U.S. China competitiveness or U.S. Russia competitiveness? and that the U.S. needs to lead here on crypto assets and the related technologies. And, and if you think that's true, then, you know, what are some of the ways that the U.S. government can, can be pro-competitive there? I think there is an international competitiveness issue. Uh, when we look at the emergence of China's sort of central bank digital currency, when we look at the current rise of Bitcoin, I think the writing is now on the wall that money and maybe a lot of other things um, are going fully digital and peer to peer. And then the question is, how do we want to architect these systems that move these peer to peer digital assets around? Do we want to build them uh, such that they have inherent central control from a government and you know, like oppressive surveillance from a government, which is quite frankly what China is building? Do we want to risk foregoing our sort of basic human rights and human dignity to the extent that we hand all of our intimate transaction details to a central authority? I think the answer is no. That would be a very un-American way to build these systems. And the alternative, the alternative is Bitcoin. The alternative is this peer-to-peer -peer network that empowers the individual, protects the privacy of the individual, and honors that individual's autonomy. You know, It says that if I want to send a Bitcoin to Lewis, I can do it directly, and I don't have to trust a corporation or a government in the middle. That's the spirit of the American West. It's the spirit of the immigrant cities. It's the spirit of what makes America a great country. And so I think, like the Clinton administration with the internet in the 1990s, we can capitalize as a nation on having a pro-innovation policy towards these new global information superhighways. The information is not just communications anymore. It's financial data, it's actual money moving around. And I think we want an open permissionless system for that, even if it means that some people will use those systems for crime. If you believe humans are genuinely good and in general good, a little bit of crime is tolerable because most people are gonna be using those permissionless networks to do the right things to move our species forward. All right, so Peter is staunchly uh, pro-privacy, pro-independence. Uh, Colleen, what do you think about um, how, you know, will regulators think a little bit of crime is acceptable? Um, is a regulated uh, sort of entity more likely to succeed here? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's hard to follow Peter on that. I think you should just close with Peter. Um, no, I, I mean, I think, you know, one of the beautiful things about this technology is that it's friendly to law enforcement and regulators, right? Um, so there, there's this ability to, Bitcoin is not fully anonymous. So there's an ability to track for nefarious activity. 
And the blockchain analytics are getting so good that today there's almost a 2.0 of those analytics where they're able to predict. So the regulators have this public transparent you know, blockchains at their disposal um, to help them regulate the space, which is obviously something that does not exist with cash. Yeah, that's great. So uh, maybe I'll let Lewis have kind of the final word here, uh, finish his thought on, on securities or, or, or a final thought on privacy and decentralization. I'll pick up, thank you, and sorry I cut off before. Yeah, I'll pick up on this last point because I think again, uh, Peter and Colleen have made some great points. The, the one thing I would add, is that if this were just about Bitcoin, it would be relatively simple. And I think, uh, Peter, you articulated the case for Bitcoin very well. The reality is we're moving to a world where value is inherently fluid and value goes far beyond Bitcoin. You know, in the past, we had a clear distinction between things that were money and you know, everything else that you bought with your money, that you invested in, that you did things. Now it's not so clear. The example I like to use are ramen noodles which normally we boil and eat as a soup, how noodles are a common currency. What we're seeing with digital assets is more and more blurring, blurring of you know, what is a digital asset and what is its purpose. Ether is used to run smart contracts on the Ethereum network, but at the same time, it's also used as a currency. You know, regulators are gonna have to you know, continue to grapple with, with that fluidity and what that means for the wider financial system. All right, well, unfortunately, I think we're gonna to have to leave it there. Um, our thanks to all of our great panelists. It's been a wonderful discussion. Obviously, there's a ton more to discuss. Uh, wish we had the time. Uh, next up, I have to introduce uh, Bloomberg News' markets and ETS reporter, Katie Greenfield. They've got a great lineup of guests. They're gonna dive into how to value such a vol volatile asset as Bitcoin and, and other crypto assets. So over to you, Katie. Thanks, Ben, and hello, everyone. My name is Katie Greifeld, and I'm a cross-asset reporter at Bloomberg News. Today, we'll be focusing on the value of Bitcoin. Cryptocurrency advocates say that it's the future of finance. Skeptics call it a Ponzi scheme. And our, own blow, our own Joe Weisenthal has argued that actually it's closer to a religion. So how do you value an asset class that means so many different things to different people? I'm thrilled to say that with me today to help answer those questions are Nick Carter from Coinmetrics and Castle Island Ventures, Joey Krug from Pantera Capital, and Caitlin Long from Avanti Bank and Trust. Thank you all for joining me. And I want to kick off for, with a question for each of you. Fiat currencies are backed by a nation's taxing power, whereas the appeal of cryptocurrency is that there's no government involved. So Caitlin, I'm going to put you in the hot seat first. Where does Bitcoin derive its value from? Bitcoin derives its value from scarcity and from network effects. Its, uh, its value is entirely subjective, which I understand is a difficult concept for folks to get their arms around. The value of fiat currency isn't, I, I would challenge, it isn't in the fact that it's the nation's taxing power. The value of fiat currency is the productive capacity of all the assets and people in that country, whereas for Bitcoin, the value really is the productive capacity of all the people and the assets in the world. And to the extent that it does become a monetary instrument, it represents the, the, a call on all the future production and, and capacity of all the people in the world in the future. So Joey, come in here next. Would you agree with that and, or what would you add? Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. I mean, I think what I'd add is I view Bitcoin as it's sort of like the most pure asset that exists. Um, you know, critics like to say it doesn't really do anything, and th that's sort of the point. Um, you know, some people call it digital gold. I, I agree with that thesis. And I think, you know, the most powerful thing about Bitcoin is that the supply can't be debased. Um, there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoins. And I mean, that's a lower inflation rate. Bitcoin already has a lower inflation rate than uh, gold does. And Nick? Bring us home. I mean, what is that? Do you also view Bitcoin as a digital gold of source? Is that where most of the value is today? Yeah, I think uh, gold is a, a convenient and reasonable analogy for Bitcoin. You can think of it as a dematerialized gold. That process of rendering a digital 
but it's still retaining some key monetary properties like the hardness of issuance, uh, the supply schedule, the relative fairness of issuance. Um, it inherits those properties from gold or has similar, you know, those are innately comparable, but then Bitcoin introduces new properties because it is dematerialized. So it's highly transmissible. It's programmable. Uh, it's very easy to verify and prove ownership of some value. That's really critical. Uh, it's easy to take physical delivery of the asset. Uh, so it contrasts really favorably with gold along those dimensions. And as Caitlin says, uh, it's an intersubjective consensus, the value of Bitcoin. Um, but because it improves upon gold in those key respects, uh, I would say it has the potential to surpass it as a monetary medium, uh, but it will ultimately be a spontaneous, wholly free market phenomenon. So, Nick, I want to stay on you and the idea of Bitcoin as digital gold, because it feels like the conversation around Bitcoin over the past year really has shifted from it being a form of payment to a store of value. You know, compared to 2017, there's far fewer articles on whether I can buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin and more about it being a cash alternative or an alternative to gold. So I'm curious whether Bitcoin's those whether those two use cases can live in harmony or at a certain point. Will the community have to prioritize one over the other? Well, we've had these debates uh, really since the the founding of Bitcoin. In fact, the first response to Satoshi on the mailing list uh, in 2008 when Satoshi proposed Bitcoin uh, involved Bitcoin's ability to potentially scale up at the base layer and satisfy the world's payment capacity. Uh, so this has been a problem that we have debated you know, literally since day one. Uh, and in fact, the Bitcoin community kind of fought a civil war over this. Uh, do we want to increase the throughput of the base network itself, or do we want to build in a layered fashion? Uh, and, and I would argue that the side that was advocating for that layered approach prevailed uh, in that conflict of visions. And that is really the main way we see people building on Bitcoin today. Uh, you know, understanding that there are constraints in terms of the data overhead of the network and that it's more likely that Bitcoin will evolve to mirror the way that payments and settlement networks work uh, in the established uh, payment space where you have utility scale settlement networks at the base, similar to Fedwire, for instance, and then many layers on top of that where payments occur, where settlement is not immediate, settlement is deferred. Uh, and that is the vision that I see most Bitcoin developers and corporates working towards today, that layered approach. And, and that's the one that makes the most sense to me, frankly. So, Caitlin, I'd love to bring you in here since I know this is something you've spent a lot of time thinking about. I mean, where do you fall on that sort of debate, you know, a payment versus a store of value? Well, Right now, I, I think the character of Bitcoin has changed as its price has gone up and as its network effects have ex literally exploded, uh, especially in the last five years, but throughout its whole history. And, and, and Nick is absolutely right. Money is layered. Money, in, in, if you think about central banks, is layered. The only central bank money that most of us have access to is, is our physical paper bills. Otherwise, the bank the money that we consider to be dollars or euros or yen is mostly bank deposits. That's a layer two on top of the base layer of of commercial bank of, of central bank money. The monetary base is to put it in in the M's uh, for those economists out there. Monetary base is M zero, and then you've got M one, which includes banknotes, and then um, M two and M three, etc. And so we have layered money in traditional money. And where Nick is going on, and I completely agree with him, is that Bitcoin itself has evolved to be the base layer of a Bitcoin ecosystem. We have so-called layer two technologies uh, like, um, like the Liquid Network, like the Lightning Network, um, that, that are built on top of that base layer where Bitcoin itself is the base money. And then we actually have other technologies that are anchored to it. The big difference with Bitcoin is that those, those, those uh, layer two technologies are not leverage. M2 through traditional fractional reserve banking represents leverage. But in the Bitcoin system, those base layer and those upper layer, layer two technologies are anchored to the base layer. So you're not actually 
destabilizing the system by introducing leverage by, by introducing these layer two technologies. One last quick point. Someone uh, pointed out to me that Bitcoin itself, we call it the base layer, um, but if you look at it from the internet perspective, they look at it, this person looked at it as layer seven. It's the monetary layer of the internet. And so these layer two technologies that are being built in the Bitcoin network are really layer eight of the internet, to use, to use his analogy. So I want to go back to the digital gold theme, because as a cross-asset reporter, I spend a lot of time talking to investors and, and discussing the value of Bitcoin, and inevitably it gets compared to gold a lot. So Joey, a common pushback I hear to Bitcoin being pitched as digital gold or as a cash alternative is that it's so much more volatile than either of those things. For example, if you look at Bitcoin's 30-day implied volatility, it's about six times higher than that of gold. So I'm curious, what would you say to an asset manager or to a corporate treasurer trying to reconcile that volatility with their balance sheet? Yeah, so I think you know one way to reconcile the volatility is to just size the position appropriately, right? So you would put on a smaller position size to start off with. I think the other thing is the volatility here is, is a benefit of it. If you think about Bitcoin, you're effectively buying a call option on you know either the future of what people use as a store of value you know, I don't really know anybody in my age bracket who owns gold, but, you know, maybe 30 to 40 percent of the people I know own Bitcoin. So that's one angle. It's a call option and, and volatility is good for options. You know, I think it's all about if you're a treasurer trying to, to decide whether to put a Bitcoin position on or not. Part of it's just in the sizing of the position. You know, obviously, you don't want to take too much risk so that you can't sleep at night. But I think the volatility is a benefit um, as, as opposed to a downside here. Well, a follow-up to that is, I mean, in terms of sizing the position appropriately, what do you think is a reasonable allocation if you're a corporate treasurer, for example? Yes, yeah, so I think I think part of it depends on your risk tolerance, right? I think uh, Mass Mutual recently put, you know, 100 million in, and in their balance sheet, that's you know negligible. Um, that would be like five bucks in in my wallet. Um, versus if you look at a company like Square, you know, they put uh, 5% of their of their cash into Bitcoin. You know, it's just a personal view. My my perspective is I think the appropriate numbers somewhere between one to three percent. Uh, something where if it goes up 10x, it's super meaningful. And if it you know goes to zero, which I think is incredibly unlikely at this point. Uh, but if it did, you know, you, you only lose one to three percent. It's not a going concern risk for your business. Right. And so, Caitlin, I want to swing this question to you because Tesla and MicroStrategy have obviously made big waves by adding Bitcoin to their balance sheets. We heard from Micro, M Michael Saylor earlier today that he plans to do more. And there was a really interesting survey by Garner. They, fed, they surveyed 77 finance executives in February and found that only 5 percent plan to hold crypto on their books this year at all. And to Joey's point that a 1 to 3 percent allocation probably looks appropriate. Does that 5% figure strike you as a high or low number? And how important is getting Bitcoin on balance sheets to continuing the rally that we've seen over the past year? Well, for corporate treasurers, it's not important because that was always going to be, I think, a fairly small piece of the pie for now because the accounting for Bitcoin is asymmetrical. It's not, it's not pretty. It's accounted for as an indefinite intangible, same accounting as as gold. And what it means in plain English is it's it carried on financial statements at the lower of cost or market, unless you happen to be an investment company, which corporates generally are not. And if it's lower of cost or market, you're always marking it down. You're never marking it up until you sell it. So, so a surprise impairment charge may hit. I, I have called on accountants to work with FASB to fix this because one of the strange things is if a corporate buys Bitcoin, Bitcoin through a fund or gold through a fund, then they get to mark it up and down. But if they actually buy the underlying Bitcoin or gold, they only get to mark it down until they sell it. That's just that, that that's a, that's a that's just the wrong accounting. And um, and FASB needs to fix it, just like we fixed the laws to accommodate Bitcoin. In my native state of Wyoming, the the, the accounting rules need to be adapted adopted for um, the the reality of the new world we live in. So, from your point of view, does that kind of increase the urgency for SEC approval of a Bitcoin ETF, for example? 
Well, we're starting to see more institutional funds. So um, I, I, I don't think that, that, that the two are related. Um, but, but I do think there are a number of corporations. If we step back and, and ask about the corporate treasury um, bid for Bitcoin, what, what MicroStrategy has done is really not that different than what the big and ger German industrialists did as they started to see the devaluation of the currency um, ahead of the hyperinflation. I'm not predicting that hyperinflation is going to hit. I'm just saying that that there is a, there is a historical analogy, uh, and and we have a number of tech companies, Square included. Square started with a two percent allocation, now moved it up to a five percent allocation. Um, obviously, Tesla, Overstock.com was the first to do it back in 2014. Um, so it's a small number of companies, but. Um, where, they're, where, where I'm going is that especially the tech companies have huge cash piles, and they really do need to start thinking about that cash as, as an asset that may be burning a hole in their pocket. What is the purchasing power of that cash in this environment? And is there something that they should be doing as fiduciaries for their shareholders to protect the purchasing power of that cash? And I think especially tech companies, it, it's not a surprise to me that some of the most forward-thinking, um, innovative companies are the first ones to dip their toes into this water and in spite of the difficult accounting um, are, are, are making allocations because they're making a judgment call that it's the right thing for their shareholders in, in order to maintain the purchasing power of the corporation's assets. So this brings to mind a kind of philosophical question for me, and I, sw I want to swing it to you, Nick. So as we see Wall Street and various companies get more involved with crypto and growing institutional adoption, that's been cited as a big reason behind this bull run that we've seen. But I'm kind of wondering, is that embrace by Wall Street kind of at odds with the original spirit of Bitcoin? That's a good question. I think um, a lot of early Bitcoin adopters um, did expect that Bitcoin one day would become a, a global storehold of wealth that was material and scale. Certainly, Halfini did. Um, and I think it would be naive to imagine that that growth would not be accompanied by institutionalization. I think the question is really, can Bitcoin, the asset, resist capture from Wall Street um, or any large asset managers or financial firms? And I think we have strong evidence that the answer is yes. Um, so in 2017, there was effectively an attempt to capture and a, and a uh, sort of change that a lot of Bitcoin corporates were trying to push through to Bitcoin, and that was defeated uh, by the community that wanted to keep it more in line uh, with what they felt were the core values of the project. Um, the other thing that's um, interesting about Bitcoin is it's relatively frictionless to take final uh, physical delivery of the asset. So even in the presence of intermediation, that's not a deal breaker for Bitcoin uh, in terms of individuals being able to really you know, take ownership of their keys. because it's easy to exit a custodian or a bank or an intermediary, which means that it's more difficult for the asset to get truly captured and put into some sort of walled garden situation like we see with gold uh, in the LBMA. So the asset itself has these properties which make it sort of uniquely resistant to capture and empower individuals and regular users relative to those uh, third-party intermediary. So I think that's real cause for optimism. So we actually have an audience question, which kind of gets at what I was saying about the spirit of Bitcoin. It's if and when it happens, what event, what effect will the advent of central bank digital currencies have on Bitcoin and all other cryptos? So Nick, let's stay with you. But I mean, I'd love to uh, throw that question at both Joey and Caitlin too, if you'd like to share. Well, I'll start. So I've been following the CBDC debate very closely. I, I read all of the white papers published by all the various central banks. And the one commonality that sticks out to me in every single one of them is language to the tune of, yes, we need to have embedded KYC and AML. We need to have embedded surveillance capacity. And they sort of beat around the bush at all. But you won't find a central bank out there saying, we are going to provide an instrument which is digital but has the exact same qualities as physical cash, which is true privacy and true transactional autonomy. You will not see a central bank committing to that with their CBDC programs. So if you compare Bitcoin to that, Bitcoin does give you transactional freedom. That is by design. 
and it gives you a measure of privacy. So to me, I see Bitcoin as starkly opposed in the objectives and the things that it permits you to do, uh, starkly you know, differentiated from a CBDC. And so while CBDCs may look cosmetically similar to Bitcoin, it's a completely different product. So I don't really see them competing on the domains where Bitcoin thrives, which is transactional freedom, transactional autonomy, and ability to resist surveillance. And I, I, yeah, actually, I would add to that. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Uh, uh, Nick, Nick said it very well. Um, uh, inside the fiat currency systems, of course, is, uh, is the, the global agreements that are driven primarily by U.S. foreign policy uh, to, to require surveillance on, on banks. Um, Bitcoin itself is not surveilled, but it is important to understand that it is a pseudonymous network, not a anonymous network. And the ability to plug Bitcoin into the banking system is a function in part of the fact that there are surveillance firms, private surveillance firms that can actually trace transactions. Uh, this is in part how law enforcement is done on, on Bitcoin. It is, it is not an anonymous network. And as a result, uh, there is not as much illicit finance uh, as as one might think. And one of the biggest reasons for that is precisely because uh, criminals now know that uh, they can be traced, uh, and and you can always trace some crime created with a keyboard back to an IP address. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, Joey, um, unless you like, yeah, continue. Sorry. Oh, I, I was just gonna say, you know, I think it, it's pretty different. Like the whole kind of central bank digital currency thing. It, it reminds me of like when people when the internet first came out. They took photos of newspapers and, and put them on the internet. That's that's sort of how like the the newspaper business initially uh, migrated to the to the web, and I think it's just so different. I think um, you know for this for this stuff to succeed, it, it really almost has to be kind of a a parallel system built from scratch, and then there's going to be bridges in companies that bridge the old system and the new one. Uh, but but it's not like you're going to be able to just create a central bank digital currency and the average consumer in the U.S. is going to have access to it, and it's and it's amazing. It, it kind of reminds me of fintech companies. I think most of fintech today, outside of the blockchain space, is sort of like putting lipstick on a pig. You, you still have the same broken rails underneath, <laughs> and so you, you can't do a whole lot with that. Uh, which is why, like, you know, you have apps like Robinhood, which are pretty cool, but you know, if you look at the GameStop example, they, these systems still break down because the fundamental stuff at the core um, is is really antiquated, in in my opinion. So, Joey, I want to stick with you, and I want to return to a topic we touched a little bit on, but economists up and down Wall Street have been warning that inflation is coming as the economy gets closer to reopening and we potentially have another big fiscal package on the way. But what's interesting to me is that even as bond yields have been backing up and break-even inflation rates have been, ri has been rising, you haven't seen much action out of Bitcoin. It's been really treading water, it feels like, through much of this action. So I'm curious whether, you know, the activity over the past week or so has put a sort of a dent on that Bitcoin as an inflation hedge thesis. I don't think so. I mean, I think, you know, Bitcoin went from from 20 something thousand last year to now it's in, in the 50 thousands, which is, you know, massive outperformance relative to every other asset class. <laughs> and it, it doesn't go straight up, you know, th this asset, because it's so volatile, it does often have, you know, 30 to 40 percent pullbacks, even in the middle of a bull market, uh, which is really wild. You know, in, in traditional finance, a 30 to 40 percent pullback would be a massive bear market. In crypto, you know, that's that's a swing that you see along the way uh, as as part of the bull run. And so I think um, I think it's still pretty healthy. I think in, in terms of price action, I think things will be kind of back to normal, you know, by April, if not sooner. Um, I think the market just sometimes takes a little bit of time to to let off steam, it's, it's not gonna go up in a straight line. So you wouldn't connect the price action of the past couple of weeks to the inflation uh, debate that's been percolating within more traditional markets? I, I think there might be some connection there. You know, there, there is more traditional finance players taking part in the crypto markets, but, but still it's not that huge. You, you know, you still have a huge amount of traders based in Asia, some in Europe, it, it really is a global phenomenon. And so I think uh, part of it may be that that macro kind of story that you're mentioning, and then part of it's just 
you know, it, it ran up super, super rapidly in Jan and Feb. And the market sometimes just blows off steam. And, you know, the macro stuff is kind of a story uh, that, that people tell to, to explain why it, why it kind of came off a bit. But I think you can also explain it just by, you know, technical indicators as well. So in a panel about the value of Bitcoin, I feel like I have to bring up Tether. So just to recap the news from earlier this week, Bitfinex paid to settle a New York probe into Tether, and New York Attorney General Letitia James said that Tether's claims that its virtual currency was fully backed by U.S. dollars at all times was a lie. So, Caitlin, I mean, given that about 55 percent of all Bitcoin purchases are estimated to be conducted with Tether, what does this mean for Bitcoin going forward? Well, there, Bitcoin is connected to the traditional fiat currency systems. There are bridges, uh, to Joy's point, about uh, that, that enable money to flow in and out, and that is really important to the, the growth of the network. Had those bridges not been there, uh, we wouldn't be where we are in terms of the network effects. And um, that is exactly what Avanti is building, a, a bridge. Uh, and we, we are actually um, uh, approved to issue, not open yet, but approved to issue something called Avit, which is actually going to be issued on a, a Bitcoin layer two technology, the liquid network. And uh, it would be a banknote. It is actually a commercial bank obligation akin to a digital cashier's check, different than a stable coin in legal and accounting and tax structures. Of course, I can't give advice on any of those three topics, uh, but it's designed uh, to solve some of the institutional challenges with stable coins, which exist in, in a gray area on, on those three topics. Uh, and so um, the, in the retail market, you're absolutely right. Tether has actually been one of the most important liquidity drivers for crypto assets generally because it's a U.S. dollar equivalent token. Uh, and and uh, where, where I'm going is that it's it actually turned out to be a very important bridge between the two industries. And, and the more bridges that we can build, the easier it is for money to flow back and forth between the two. I completely agree that the crypto sector is, is being built in parallel. It is fundamentally, uh, its architecture system-wise is very different than the architecture of the traditional financial system, which is built on intermediaries, layers of intermediaries, and built on a delayed net settlement basis. Whereas the crypto industry is built on a real-time gross settlement basis that enables peer-to-peer. -peer. Those are fundamentally different architectures, and it is very difficult to plug in that new architecture into the old traditional financial services companies, which is why the industries are being built in parallel, and bridges like the tethers and stable coins of the world have turned out to be very important infrastructure to bridge the two. Well, Caitlin, let's keep in touch on Avid because that sounds fascinating. But Nick, I want to bring a kind of ethical question to you when it comes to Tether. It's interesting to me that, you know, Letitia James said that this turned out to be a lie, but the community just continued to ex accept that and keep using Tether. I mean, is there any takeaway there that on, on an ethical level that, you know, the community was so willing to write that off? Well, if you listen to what the community has been saying, we've been asking Tether to produce solvency attestations for years now. And for whatever reason, they failed to do so, which is disappointing. But if you look at the settlement, there's an agreement to provide two years now of uh, transparency as to the reserves. Uh, so that's good news. And I think whether you're a Bitcoin critic or an enthusiast, you should be celebrating that. Uh, Tether's lack of transparency was a black cloud hanging over the industry for a long time, uh, but this settlement uh, kind of puts a coda on that. It, it, it provides us some assurances, assuming that these reserve attestations do occur, uh, that Tether is backed, uh, which is good news. Historically, as we found out with the, the settlement, they were unbacked for certain periods. To me, that's indicative of the way that the government and the bank sector engages with the crypto industry, or they've engaged historically, which is to de-platform firms like Bitfinex uh, and Tether. And so a lot of their troubles trace back to the state using the banking sector uh, to de-platform disfavored industries. That seems to have changed a little bit now, 
uh, for the better. And so now crypto firms can obtain banking. But the ultimate responsibility for Tether's struggles lies with these efforts like Chokepoint to keep crypto out of banking. And I'm pretty glad that that's not the case anymore. So we have just over two minutes left, and I want to close with a kind of rapid fire round for you guys. I'm curious, what in the crypto sphere in the next 12 months are you most excited about? So Caitlin, kick us off. I think the Federal Reserve this year is going to have a, an official pronouncement uh, related to crypto firms getting access to the payment system. There are multiple applications now in front of it and uh, big policy issues, but big policy opportunities. I completely agree with Nick's uh, prediction that um, having these instruments inside the banking system, especially uh, US dollar stable coins, actually is good for the US dollar's position as a reserve currency. All right, Joey, you're up next. What are you excited about in the year to come? Yeah, I, I think I'm probably most excited about the the whole decentralized finance sector. Um, you know, people are basically rebuilding finance kind of from the ground up with a clean slate. Uh, everything from you know lending to you know new asset issuance to trading uh, to brokers and custody, all in a decentralized manner. And uh, I think that's super exciting. And the only other thing I'm excited about is I'm excited about uh, layer twos, you know, both on Bitcoin and also on Ethereum. I think, uh, you know, I've been in this space a long time and everything's been seven to 10 transactions a second for so long. And I think this year that's going to actually change in like a meaningful way where the actual end user uh, gets to see it a lot. Um, and so I'm excited for that. All right, Nick, bring us home. You have 20 seconds. What are you most excited about in the year to come? I would say, um, renewed credibility from the intermediaries in the Bitcoin and crypto space. Um, so proof of solvency, proof of reserve attestations. Uh, I know there's a lot in the pipeline there, and that will allow them to be seen as just far more credible uh, by the depositors effectively. All right. Well, Nick, Joey, Caitlin, I love speaking with you today, and I learned so much. So thank you guys so much for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes today's event. Thank you to everyone in the audience and to all of our speakers for taking the time. And special thanks goes to our sponsors for today's events, BitGo and Grayscale Investments. To learn more about the work they're doing, please click on the resources tab above. Also be sure to follow at Bloomberg Live on Twitter and LinkedIn for updates on future events. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing on bloomberg.com slash subscriptions. Thank you again very much for joining us today, and we'll see you at the next one.